what we're basically going to talk about today is fisheries, aquaculture, and tourism, and the legal barriers that you all will face um, should you decide to go down that road. It's a very general discussion. You definitely, if you want to look into this and you know really consider it, you know look into and hire an attorney to kind of just really get specific as to your specific um, your specific applications and what you will actually face um, itself. Um, what we'll talk about in the first section is Coast Guard vessel regulations, foreign constructed vessels, the American with Disabilities Act, vessel operator licenses, and fishing permits and licenses that you may or may not have at this time that could help you down the road. Um, uh, all right, so moving on, also one of the things we really won't discuss that much is fishing vessel um, regulations, commercial fishing vessels, because we're under the assumption that you all currently comply with them. We're only going to be focusing on passenger vessel regulations for time. Um, basically, there's two types of categories. There's uninspected passenger vessels and inspected passenger vessels. Um, uninspected passenger vessels, these are your smaller vessels. These are what's known as um, six-pack boats. They carry six, pack, um, six passengers for hire. Um, Basically, you must be compliant with all federal standards, um, safety, navigation, pollution prevention for that vessel. Um, this includes life jackets for everyone on board, uh, required number of throwables, visual distress signals, fire extinguishers, pollution placards, pretty much what your vessel should have. The big thing is you know, the navigational charts, guides, as well as all the safety gear. Um, having a life jacket on board for every single passenger that is on that vessel. Um, <coughs> what you also will need to do is conduct safety, um, kind of like a safety orientation, go through the vessel, okay, the life jackets are in that locker. Um, you know, this is the VHF, should something happen to me, this is how you work it. You know, there's where the fire extinguishers are. Basically, especially if you're a single um, operator, um, with no one else on board, you want them to at least know something should something happen to you and you get incapacitated. They're not left, you know, without any help. You are subject to Coast Guard boardings while you're operating the vessel. Um, they're going to board, you know, try and be compliant, you know, before you leave the dock. Don't take passengers because, you know, they're going to find you and, you know, they can get very expensive very quickly. Um, to ensure compliance with the Coast Guard, uh, I believe that the Coast Guard or the Coast Guard Auxiliary does courtesy inspections and they can go through the vessel and kind of tell you where you're lacking and where you know you need to improve and this way you know you're up you know you're compliant and you know down the road you shouldn't have any real issues and I believe they are free and confidential and are available at the local Coast Guard sector's office if you call them and say you'd like to come down. Um, Inspected passenger vessels, uh, there's actually two categories here. There's large passenger vessels. These are over 100 gross tons. They carry more than 12 passengers in general. And small passenger vessels, because um, most of the size vessels, we're going to concentrate on small passenger vessels. Um, these are less than 100 gross tons. The main thing here is your certificate of inspection. That is pretty much, and your inspection itself. That will tell you everything that you're really required to have. Um, it's specific to that vessel. It will describe the vessel, the route, the manning requirements that you're required to have, whether you're required to have a master as well as um, deckhands, depending on you know, the number of passengers you carry, the ratio of passengers to crew, um, the safety and survival gear that you'll need to have aboard, um, the maximum number of passengers that you're allowed to carry on board that vessel, and uh, like I said, the maximum number of crew. Um, Total number of passengers a vessel can carry is determined by several factors. Um, total weight of the passengers, uh, stability restrictions, where the vessel is actually operating. We have a vessel back um, from where I'm from that's not allowed to exceed, uh, I believe it's two miles on the COI from the nearest land. You know, they can tell you where or where you cannot operate. Um, the vessel layout itself, um, vessel evacuation ability, the minimum seating requirements. Do you have enough seats on board the vessel for every one? 
Um, one of our vessels we refitted and we ended up removing some seats and we ended up losing passenger capacity because we no longer had enough seats for everyone. Um, so even though we could carry 40, we're only allowed to seat 30, we can only seat 37. Now we have, you know, we're only allowed to carry 37. Um, basically in order to obtain a vessel inspection, you would uh, file an application with the officer in charge of marine inspection. Um, during the inspection, the inspector, you know, you'd go and schedule a um, inspection. They'd come down and look at the vessel. Um, they will go through everything on that vessel and look at everything. And if you don't think that it is something, you know, serious, you know, they'll concentrate on and look over everything from top to bottom. Um, they'll look at the workmanship, the condition, its machinery, engines, all that stuff, life saving equipment, emergency equipment that you have on board. Um, they also will require a dry dock to actually walk around and visually inspect the vessel itself. Um, at your expense, you'll have to haul and block the vessel um, so that they can look at it. They'll look at all the stringers and the structural. Um, this is actually required every two years for vessels that operate in salt water. Um, they'll require a stability inspection. Um, this is to determine you know, the passenger count and how many passengers that your vessel can actually carry. Um, that's been a big issue in recent years with overloading and you'll see a lot, um, maybe about five, ten years ago, the capsizing of vessels when they're over capacity. Um, one thing that you will need to pay attention to is the average weight and the regulations with regards to weight. Um, currently it's 185 pass pounds um, is the average weight that they'll judge, I believe right now. Um, years ago it was 145 pounds. Um, when we had vessels uh, in service, one of our vessels, actually the one right here um, at the top left, um, was licensed to carry uh, 36 passengers for hire. The new regulations came out and she got knocked down to 27. That was a fun conversation to have with the owner of the company that his vessel now lost nine seats um, because of just the way the stability, you know, the vessel went. Um, one of the things that they're going to look for and look at is all the safety equipment on board the vessel. Um, if the life-saving equipment on board the vessel isn't up to terms, and especially these PFDs, you'll have to destroy the life-saving equipment in front of them so that you can't say, all right, I'll get rid of them, no problem. No, they actually want to see you destroy them in front of them. Um, one of the things, life-saving equipment on board the vessel, the COI, it goes by the COI. It'll tell you what you need to have. If you need to have an EPIRB, number of throwables, um, life rings, uh, hard raft, you know, all that stuff. Um, basically, the rule of thumb with regards to life jackets, it's the number of passengers on board. You'll also want to maybe get a couple more um, just to be on the safe side. And the rule of thumb for children's life jackets is 10% of the vessel's maximum number of passengers. Um, so if you have 30 passengers, three to four life jackets, always go for more, especially if you have fam a lot of families coming on board, you'll have enough life ja child life jackets for every child on board that vessel. Um, you may require abandoned ship drills and man overboard drills and things like that. This way you know if someone is in the water, you can get them safely on board your vessel. Um, you know, vessels can continue operating as commercial vessels once they're, um, they have, are inspected. Um, and moving on. Now, foreign constructed vessels. This was a topic that got brought up during the actual um, research and it's a very interesting area. Uh, if you have a foreign constructed vessel, basically the law is black and it, it's plain. If you have a foreign constructed vessel, you really can't carry passengers for hire. There are certain exceptions that are um, to the rule and whether or not you can do it and where the vessel operates. Um, it's very technical, very specific <coughs> to that area. Um, if you do have a foreign construction, generally the rule of thumb is do you have a, is your vessel documented? If your vessel is documented, generally you should be fine. If you do have any questions, you will want to also, and you do have a foreign constructed vessel, you'll want to contact and talk to Customs and Border Patrol because I believe they're the ones that currently handle that stuff. Um, 
you really don't want to get tagged with anything because I believe the fine for a violation is $300 per passenger. <laughs> so it can get very expensive if your vessel holds 10 people. Um, moving on, the American with Disabilities Act. Vessel owners and operators must take steps to accommodate passengers with disabilities. Um, and their facilities themselves must be accept, uh, um, accessible for everyone with a disability. Um, the, vessel, uh, the regulations apply to owners and operators of passenger vessels which are primarily engaged in carrying passengers for hire. Commercial fishing vessels might not be covered. Um, it's something that you'd want to talk about um, to the Department of Transportation because you may or may not be um, covered or what are the requirements that I need to know about and be compliant with. Um, also, your vessels may be grandfathered into the current regulations themselves, depending on when it was constructed. Um, a, uh, if ADA regulations do apply, in general, vessel owners and operators are not allowed to discriminate against general people with disabilities. Um, you can if, um, you can for various reasons, uh, including um, the legitimate safety concern. They, carry, they have a motorized wheelchair. You know, those get very heavy. Now you're throwing off the stability of the vessel. You know, any objections, they must be in writing. Um, just saying, you know, outlining the reasons why. Um, dock facilities also must be accessible um, and usable by the individuals with disabilities. And whenever a, ves a individual with a disability um, wants to get on board, you should always offer, in general, my personal opinion, um, help assisting in um, disembark any person getting on and off your vessel. It's just um, a good practice to have because in case they slip and fall, it's not going to be good to try and pull someone out between the dock and the, the boat. This is a couple of licenses, the Merchant Mariner's credential, your Transportation Workers Identification credential, TWIC, as well as your Marine Radio Operator Permit. Um, we'll start talking about uh, the Merchant Mariner credential first. Um, this is basically your captain's license. Um, it originally used to be a certificate that had to get mounted. It's that diploma looking like uh, one. That used to have to get mounted. Since then, they've gone towards what's called an MMC, Merchant Mariner Credential, which is almost that, that red passport looking document. Um, there are many grades and endorsements available. Uh, two that you guys will be focused on is your basic six-pack uh, operator of uninspected passenger vessels that allows you to carry six passengers for hire on an uninspected passenger vessel or a master's license which is um, some more schooling and other tests. Um, basically in order to obtain an MMC the applicant must complete Coast Guard application, pass a Coast Guard written examination, um, obtain their transportation workers identification credential, pass a drug test, have evidence of sea time, pass a physical examination, um, allow Coast Guard driving records and background checks, obtain CPR and first aid certification, be a U.S. citizen, and sworn in as a Merchant Marine officer, which is why you have the Merchant Marine guy there. Um, basically, the Coast Guard uh, application, um, for this application, it's very important to be truthful on it. If you lie and you're, you know, you think some, oh, something that happened 10 years ago, if they find out about it, it's an automatic revocation. You know, you'll get a notice in the mail, they'll come after it. So full disclosure, it's not, oh, I'm sorry, no. It's, you know, full disclosure and they'll work with you as well. There's ways of, you know, if you've had a, you know, past where, you know, you've had drug use or something like that, there's guidelines in place that if you've reformed, you know, you can definitely, you know, get your license. One of the things that I would suggest if you do have um, the, some issues in the background and you have to answer yes to any of those questions on the application is getting a professional consultant to pre help you prepare your license because they'll be able to present you in a light most favorable to yourself and, and really help the process. Um, Basically, there's um, the written examination in order to get your license. It's four sections, rules of the road, navigational rules and regulations, deck general, safety, navigation, um, 
deck general navigation and naviga navigation plotting. Um, there's a couple ways you can go about taking the exam. One of them is going and signing up at the regional exam center, I believe here it's in Boston is the nearest one. Um, or you can sign up for a pre-approved, Coast Guard approved licensing course. I did the licensing course and this is basically why. Um, they will help teach you how to take the course. So, you know, everyone's mariners, you know, you know everything, but you don't necessarily know how, you know, the finer points on the licensing and the finer points on how to take the test. Also, one of the benefits is with regards to rules of the road, they have an approved test. The Coast Guard standard test is I believe they can pull from over 2,000 questions. A Coast Guard course, uh, approved course, usually it's 200 questions. For navigation, if you fa fail, get uh, less than a 90% on the navigation part, you fail that section. 10 questions, you get two wrong, you failed it. Um, so, and they'll also teach you navigation, you know, things like that, that you might be, you know, a little lacking on. Um, TWIC, moving on. Um, Basically, you must have a valid, uh, you must receive a transportation worker's identification credential. A TWIC, um, basically, it is security clearance in the ports. They'll do a security background check, things like that. If you apply for your original application, you must get it because that's how they get your fingerprints and biometrics to do your background checks. Um, years ago, when I, years ago, it was originally you used to have to go and get a, um, your fingerprints done by the uh, police. Then when I did it, the regional exam centers had fingerprint capability. Now they get it from the, uh, the TSA. Um, uh, it's required now some updating differences between the actual ex uh, report that we did two years ago and now. A Couple of years ago when we were doing the report, there was some discussion about being able to opt out of a TWIC. The regulations didn't really say much and there was nothing really written down as to whether or not you can opt out after you've gotten your TWIC and you hold a mass uh, license. From what I see, the Coast Guard is allowing someone to opt out if you no longer work in a secure, um, in an area that does not have a security plan. That's kind of what I'm seeing. I would still recommend someone get a TWIC because you really don't know. It's kind of a gray area that I've found. Um, they're valid for, in order to get a TWIC, you apply to the TWIC Enrollment Center. It's, you know, a lot of these websites and government websites are very helpful. They have a lot of checklists, you know, the Mariners, um, National Maritime Center for your captain's license. They have great checklists that you can go down, make sure you're compliant. Same with TWIC, you know, they have pretty good checklists. You will apply for the Enrollment Center, um, complete the disclosures, pay the fee, They'll scan your fingerprints and they'll notify you, you know, when you, if you get approved and when your license is in the mail. You have to actually go pick it up. You cannot have them mail it to you. They want you to pick it up. Um, it's valid for five years. Drug testing. Um, you must submit proof that you passed a chemical test for dangerous drugs. Um, anyone who's a marine employer uh, as well, uh, if you have a couple of people working under you, you must test them regardless of whether or not they are holding an MMC, uh, holding a captain's license or operating the regulations. If that individual fails a drug test, you must report to the Coast Guard. Um, and uh, actually, if that individual fails the, and they hold an MMC, you must report to the Coast Guard, sorry. Um, and you must maintain a record of all chemical tests performed, the number of individuals, you know, who's failed tests and things like that. Um, evidence of sea time, generally it's you complete a form or show that you've you know, participated in a minimum number of days at sea. Um, also you can use your vessel documentation if you're a vessel owner, that also helps as well. Um, physical examination, you must meet the medical and physical requirements required by the Coast Guard. Um, I would recommend a little further, any physician can do it, any licensed physician. I would recommend maybe going a little further and having someone familiar with the Department of Transportation forms um, fill it out so that the National Maritime, they know the form and your 
uh, application isn't getting bounced back because you know a doctor didn't cross a T or something like that. Um, also, some things to point out: the exam includes a um, color vision test as well as a hearing test and a hearing test itself. Um, I have glasses. My license says I'm required to have a spare set on board the vessel at all times in my captain's bag. Um, if you do not meet the requirements, the, cap the Coast Guard could grant you a waiver depending on where you lack. Um, criminal driving background check. Um, criminal driving, criminal background check and driving background check. They're going to look into your history and basically the standard is whether you are of suitable character to hold a captain's license. Um, that's, you know, they'll look into it and like I said, if you have to and answer truthfully on the application and if you do have to answer yes to any of those questions, it might be good to go and in, look into having a professional consultant really help you out. Um, that's also where they, why they use your fingerprints because they'll pull up your, do a fingerprint background check as well. And then finally you'll get sworn in as a merchant marine officer, uh, deck officer in the <coughs> merchant marines. Um, basically in order to gain your master's license it's just another test and you know applying for an upgrade. Um, uh, your marine radio operator permit. This is required to operate a radio on board any inspected passenger vessel. Um, you must speak English, you must complete a 24 question FCC examination, and it's issued for the la applicant's lifetime. It's not that hard, um, but it's one of the things that you're required that you could get possibly in trouble for not having. Um, and that's it for now. Any questions now? Thoughts? Marine harvesting demonstration license. Uh, this was developed because of the limited number of commercial lobster licenses that can be issued. There's a cap. Um, if you don't have necessarily a, ca a uh, crab uh, lobster license, but you kind of want to just do tours and show how to, you know, lobster and how it works, um, you can possibly get this. Some of the restrictions: you're not allowed to fish more than 20 lobster traps. Um, you're not allowed to retain, sell, or you know, use any of the catch, and you must release everything. Um, and you must either successfully complete a lobster or crab fishing written exam, or hold a lobster um, fishing license or landed lobster and landed lobster under that license. Um, here's one of the things also that's important. If you do have it, you still must comply with all of the regulations that the lobstermen have. One of the things that we looked into when we were doing the project was maybe looking into this license if you guys can still fish on Sundays. I understand you guys can't fish for lobster on Sundays. Is that still, has that changed since, what's that? Yeah, um, so maybe, because a lot of tourists obviously come up and you know they want to go up out on Sundays, still you can't um, fish, you know, depending on, on Sundays. Um, Recreational fishing operator's license. This is basically being able to take passengers out um, for uh, the day and having them rod and reel fish. Um, you know, basically acting as a, a private charter boat. Um, if you, you know, the fishing's slow and okay, I'll take, you know, for thousand dollars, 500 bucks, taking passengers, you know, guys that want to go out and rod and reel some fish, you know, it's another option that you guys might want to look into because it allows, um, out-of-state people who don't necessarily have the required licenses to fish under your license. Um, it's worth obtaining and then you can fish if you know a lobster, the season's closed and there's something else going on. Um, basically in order to obtain it you need to be a licensed captain um, and you still must collect fishing data, number of passengers engaged in saltwater recreation and report all this to DMR. Um, moving on. Vessel owner liability. Any other questions on that section? Okay. <laughs> right, well, now, is the, uh, you went back to the demonstrator license. Uh, is that solely a, a uh, lobster crab license? From what I understand, yes. Um, it's only for that. And that was basically because there was a lot of like schools and things like that that want to teach their students um, how to lobster fish. And they couldn't obviously get a lobster license because of the closed, you know, the limited number. So that's how they went about, they developed this license that allows them to 
at least teach lobstering. Um, it's probably the best catch and release fish we have anyway. Yeah. Um, sir? Uh, on the recreational fishing operator, isn't a tidal water fishing guide license also required for fish and wildlife? Um, not that I saw. It might be, though, unless. It, it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if, if you're a licensed commercial lobster mm -hmm. and you don't want to go out on Sunday, you still need the educational no. license? No. No. Okay. That was, we kind of looked into that as may, maybe a way of you guys can, can't necessarily keep the fish, keep the lobster, but at least then you can still go out and show them and, and still do tours on a Sunday when, you know, a lot of people are out and about and want to do tours. Because, um, go ahead. If you are uh, a lobsterman and you want to give people the opportunity to actually pull traps, would that be covered under the recreational fishing operator? Um, pulling traps, as far as I understand, um, you're only allowed, and DMR might be able to help me. Um, it's only, depending on your license, you're either allowed one or have certain, because you might be acting as a member of the crew at that point. And also another issue with that is liability because your insurance provider highly doubtful that they will allow anyone near hydraulics or lines um, simply because it's very easy for someone to lose a limb. Um, I'm actually currently dealing with a case that that's the case. So uh, from a liability perspective, um, paying the play and, and hauling traps, not a good idea. Um, you know, just because of, it doesn't take much for someone to lose a finger, lose an arm, and now you're engaged in a pretty good lawsuit. Um, any other questions? Right. Um, general vessel owner operator liability. Um, first thing, we'll start off with uh, general maritime law and liability. It's primarily federal law. Um, Federal courts have original jurisdiction. However, some states' law, you know, you can file in state court under savings to suitors. Um, claims arise if it occurs on navigable waters. Basically, anyone gets hurt on your vessel, you know, it's going to be a maritime issue. Or your dock as well, because there is an extension clause um, under the laws. Uh, if it's incidental to, you know, carrying passengers and stuff. Um, Basically, vessel owners and operators owe their passengers a duty of reasonable care under the circumstances. Um, you know, just be reasonable. Don't you know? Uh, you know, don't. Uh, I'm trying to think. One of the, a way to describe reasonable care and duty of reasonable care is um, under the circumstances is a snowstorm. You're allowed to do 55 miles an hour on 95 or 65. Are you going to do that during a snowstorm? No, you probably slow down and you know be reasonable under the circumstances. Um, another thing uh, under general maritime liability, um, Congress has established that a vessel owner they've established vessel owner liability under statutes. Um, under the statute, a vessel owner is liable for any personal injury to passengers, their baggage, or their baggage if the injury or damage is caused by neglect or failure to comply with the statute. Um, that's a big thing. Uh, failure to comply with statutes are very big when it comes to maritime liability, as well as your insurance. Because if you fail to comply with an insurance, like, there's probably a clause in your insurance policy somewhere that you won't be covered. <laughs> um, so next thing you know, you're high and dry, and you're not covered. Um, if passengers' injuries, also another big thing, if passenger injuries are caused by neglect or failure to comply with the regulations, um, you'll be you'll lose your ability to limit your liability under the Limitation of Liability Act, and we'll talk about that more in the in the you know as we go on tonight. But that's a big thing. Um, in general, there's a three-year statute of limitations. Uh, injured passengers have three years to bring a civil action against the vessel owner or operator. And Congress, this is also the extension clause, has also extended liability to any injuries which occur on land but 
the proximate cause is injury to a vessel on navigable waters. Basically, they're walking down the dock to go on board your boat and they trip and fall. It's going to be, that's what it would come, because the whole point of them being on the dock is to go on board your vessel. Um, death from the High Seas Act. This occurs when a person on board your vessel passes away while you're in federal waters more than three miles offshore. Um, basically, uh, the individual, uh, basically the parent, spouse, child, or relative is entitled to co uh, cover compensation for the loss sustained by the individual um, as a result of your negligence. Uh, if the individual were to die after they've been injured as a result of their injuries from your vessel, they can also bring a Death on the High Seas Act action against you. If the injury occurs and the death occurs as a result of uh, while it was in territorial waters, like in the bay, um, the vessel sinks and unfortunately the gentleman passed away, then it's Maine's wrongful death statute applies there and they can bring an action under Maine's um, wrongful death law. Um, that's pretty much it. If someone passes away, those are the actions that you're going to get faced with. Um, one of the things, if anything were to come about and you do have an issue, get a licensed professional maritime attorney. Um, the Maritime Law Association um, keeps a database of maritime attorneys in the area that can help you out and they'll be the ones that'll be really working with you to navigate the difficult times because it is difficult um, you know having to tell clients okay well this is what what's going to happen and um, I deal with uh, my our representation is primarily vessel owner operator so I know what it's like and um, but there are ways to limit your liability um, but if anyone has questions right now we'll briefly pause no Good. All right. Um, limiting liability. Marine insurance. Uh, <laughs> um, there are many types of marine insurance. Hull insurance, crew, um, crew insurance, cargo insurance, protection and indemnity insurance. And actually, you can insure your captain's license as well. Um, basically, the Two of the things that we'll discuss is um, liability insurance, third-party liability insurance, and protecting yourself um, should an incident occur on your vessel. Um, this basically covers, you know, above and beyond your hull policy and for any loss. Um, it's the primary uh, P and I insurance is the primary maritime um, liability insurance. Uh, it covers the vessel owner for loss of life and any personal injury to passengers or crew aboard the vessel. Um, as well as people injured on shore as a result of the actions of the vessel. Um, similar to car liability insurance, um, the amount of what your insurance premium will be obviously would depend on how much coverage you want as well as, you know, it's a new area and your vessel itself, um, what are your actions and what type of um, kind of barriers are there between the fishing activities as well as the passenger area like what we talked about pay to play highly doubtful that the insurance carrier will even let you pay to have something like that and if it does if they do your insurance premiums would be you know, skyrocket it's very difficult to make the phone call that your insurance probably won't cover the injury um, and then you'll be out of pocket, or the corporation, if you are incorporated, would be out of pocket for any additional insurance, uh, any additional damages that are awarded to that individual. Um, you'd also want to get another uh, an umbrella policy itself for the corporation to kind of head, you know, really protect everything. If you have multiple boats and you operate multiple boats, this way, you know, the whole corporation itself is covered. Um, Basically, three areas that marine insurance providers would evaluate is what occurs prior to leaving the dock. You know, your orientation, you know, going through everything, you know, safety, um, okay, where to go, where not to go. Is it everything visibly marked where passengers are not allowed? Um, an example of this would be uh, in Rhode Island, I was out on the University of Rhode Island's dragger. There's clear marks on the deck where passengers can and cannot go. Um, you know, just telling people right away, all right, well, when this vessel is backhauling, you know, everyone needs to stand behind, you know, that wall. Um, things like that. What risk reduction plans are in place, such as, you know, standing behind the wall, not allowing anyone to really touch or handle 
the pots or even you know go near the machinery. Um, and what plans are in place should an incident occur? Are there written procedures as to who does what? Um, if you have several people on board the vessel or if you're a sole um, operator, what you do in the event something happens. Um, they'd also want to look at the crew ratio as well as uh, the ratio of passengers to crew. Is you know one guy, one gentleman on board with 12 you know, passengers? It's probably would be more if you have a deckhand that can actually control the passengers on board the vessel. Um, another thing that they also may require is additional safety requirements. Um, you know, that's just something they may want under the policy. Um, uh, and then basically, like I said, you should really want to be completely covered for any inch, get the best insurance that you can, the best um, um, amount of policy, you know. Because if something does happen, especially a death suit, you know, it can get very expensive very quick. And generally, the policies are written that it's per incident. So if the boat were to unfortunately go down and several people were to pass away, that's where your cap is. It's not a million dollars per individual person. It's a million dollars per that one incident. Um, another thing that uh, I'll talk about um, is um, insurance for your license. I didn't really include that in the discussion or when we were talking about it or in, in the project, but there is actually insurance out there that, can print, um, that you can get for your captain's license that should uh, the Coast Guard, if you do something wrong or they launch an investigation and they want to possibly suspend or revoke your license um, because of certain th things that occurred, you can get insurance that will protect you um, and represent you in a suspension or revocation hearing. Um, it's something else to look into. Um, you'll receive um, an attorney that can go through it and work with you and you know, defend you in such claims. Uh, without it, they can get very expensive very quickly because depending on the case, it is a full trial. Um, we just had one back in May. It was a very complicated case, but last time I checked, the fees were about forty thousand um, dollars. Luckily, the gentleman got his license back, and you know, I'm not really going to go into it. But um, it's very expensive to have a full-blown trial. Um, passenger boarding documents. This is basically a piece of paper that you give the passengers as they get on. That just kind of outlines everything, what to expect. Um, you know, you're on board a boat. The problem is, especially with tourism, you don't really know people's backgrounds. They could be from the Midwest that have never been on a boat before. You know, so you w at least want to have something and go over everything with them, what to expect. All right, you know, it's rough out. You know, one of the things, if it was very rough out, I used to tell my passengers, look, you know, I'm going to make it as smooth as possible for everyone, but just let you know, it's going to be a little bumpy. You know, things like that, at least this way, you know, they know what they're expecting, essentially. Um, another thing that you would want to do, uh, include in that document, is kind of like a waiver. Just basically say, look, you know, we're not really responsible for, you know, your wrong actions, essentially, if you were to do something wrong. Generally, waivers of liability under maritime law are not uh, enforceable, um, depending on, but it's good, something good to have that just basically outlines you know, what could happen and, you know, not really responsible for your actions. Um, forum selection clause. This is also very important for tour uh, the tourism aspect is um, you can basically have in this document that says if you were to sue me because of something, you must bring suit in Maine so that you're not getting in the mail, you know, U.S. District Court of Central Oklahoma because someone felt, tripped and fell on your vessel six months ago. If they want to bring suit, they have to bring suit in Maine. Um, the cruise industry does this a lot. Anything that happens, you need to file in um, Florida. It's on all your boarding passes. If you've ever taken a cruise and you still have the boarding pass, go back and read it. You must bring suit in Florida. Um, also helps keep down the litigation fees because now you're not having to hire your own attorney, then getting local counsel in Oklahoma because that's always fun. Um, Another thing is the Limitation of Liability Act. This is big. How many people are vessel owner operators? Okay, doesn't apply to you, unfortunately. Um, 
This is for people that hire, you have a group of vessels or you hire a captain that can take your vessel out and operate it. Um, this is so that if anything happens while under that captain's command, you're not, the corporation itself is only responsible for the amount of vessel, for the amount the vessel is worth after the accident. Um, so if the vessel is only worth fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, that's the cap. Um, and then you basically go after, you know, the captain itself, unfortunately, but that's the way that you kind of protecting the corporation more versus um, it's the way of protecting everyone. Um, if obviously it's a major claim, there are other ways, mathematical calculations to get more money for the plaintiffs because generally the corporation is the one with the insurance that has the money. Um, also, if something were to happen, you have, and let's say the vessel sinks and there's, you know, 10 claims. The Limitation Liability Act, Act allows all those claims to be consolidated into one action. So now you're not having several claims that you're now defending in multiple forums, and that can also get very expensive very quickly. All right. Um, aquaculture farms. Uh, duty of care. Traditionally, many years ago, many, many years ago, it used to be three categories. A trespasser, a licensee, and an invitee. Um, Tourists on an aquaculture farm would be considered an invitee. Um, in Maine, nowadays it's been changed over and a business owner owes a positive duty of exercising reasonable care in basically providing a safe, re um, a reasonably safe premises um, wherein he or she knows or should know risks of customers on his presence. Uh, so basically, you should know all the risks on your aquaculture farm should something were to happen. Um, basically, uh, that's your duty of care. Um, recreational use statute, under Maine's recreational use, this is a lot of the UPIC, um, things like that. Not UPIC, um, opening public um, parks, things like that, where you can just go picnic and things like that. You don't necessarily pay. That's the recreational use statute. Um, use statute. Um, you don't really need to warn of any of the hazard conditions or activities on the premises. Um, and you don't have a duty of care to keep the premises safe. Uh, but this really only applies um, when you're opening it up for free. So if you just want people to come in and look at your aquaculture farm, no charge, then that would apply. But as soon as you start taking money or consideration as, as it's termed, then that really doesn't apply and you'd have to go under the standard duty of care. Um, another thing, if you need a vessel to access your aquaculture farm, I understand some of these are offshore, you'd also be required to, you know, conform with all the passenger vessel requirements that we've just talked about. Um, biosecurity. This is another big thing. Um, basically the goal of biosecurity programs are to reduce the risk of, um, ri risk of disease introduction minimize spread on farm to other new areas and promote fish health, uh, protect economic investment, reputation, and protect against new diseases and human health. Um, basically, it's disease, in, uh, disease introduction and spread prevention. Um, biosecurity programs are very customized to that particular aquaculture farm. Um, when developing a plan, you must identify any safety hazards such as how diseases could spread and the risk factors to that individual farm itself. Um, risks, uh, you must assess the risks and determine what biosecurity measures are needed to prevent such risks. Um, and the plan should include um, programs that prevent visitors from entering the aquaculture farm that could possibly carry foreign pathogens or disease into the facility. And examples of this would be posting signs and notices to all visitors to not necessarily put your hands in the water and try and touch the fish. It's protecting your, um, from loss or damage to your property. It's not necessarily liability insurance, so you would want to get liability insurance as well should anyone fall or get hurt on your aquaculture farm. You know, getting an umbrella policy to really just cover everything. Um, in addition, uh, You'd want to maintain a clean and safe facility 
and you should reg always regularly inspect the property and teach all your employees. If something looks amiss or something looks like it could be dangerous, a grate's knocked out of place, you know, something needs to be fixed, teach them to fix it. Document anything that's been fixed. Documenting and recording anything um, and, and also perform weekly inspections. Walk around the facility, look at what needs to get fixed, what you know, ways to improve it, having, um, uh, what's the word, um, questionnaires. You know, what did you think about the thing, uh, what did you think about this um, tour? You know, getting feedback from the tourists, you know, seeing what they want actually on your facility. Um, proper training of all your facilities and how to deal with um, tourism people like, uh, and tourists on your property. Um, that's pretty much aquaculture right there. Uh, any questions? Okay. Business organizations. Um, there's several organizations. Really, to select the proper one, you'd want to talk to your both attorney and your accountant because really it's how you're taxed that determines um, what but it's both a cross between liability protection and how you're taxed and how you want to pay taxes. Um, the first is a sole proprietorship. This is basically I own a vessel and I want to go carry passengers for hire. You know, I don't really form any corporate entity or anything like that. And you basically would file taxes on your own personal, you file your own personal taxes. You don't need to register with the state. You're essentially the business, it's you. Problem is, if something were to happen, they can sue you and take everything, all your personal assets as well. Um, general partnership, it's basically a sole proprietorship with multiple partners, equal shares. Um, they all share in the liability um, as well. So if you're one partner messed up, well, they're gonna come after you as well for whatever losses were sustained. Um, you also don't need to register the business and you basically pay taxes individually. Um, a limited partnership. This uh, is where you have one person that invests the money and then you operate the, you know, the partnership. Um, the, a certificate of partnership would have to be filed with the state. Typically the limited partner has no control over any of the operations, they're just the money man. Um, as a result, the limited partner is only liable for the amount of his investment. So he invests $100,000, that's the cap as far as his liability should something happen. It's a control issue. He's not in control of anything, so they're not really going to take, you know, make him accountable. Um, a limited liability partnership, this is a partnership in which the, each partner is not liable for the actions of the other partner. Um, or the actions of an employee which is under the supervision of that partner. Um, certificate of limited liability must, uh, partnership must be filed with the state and these are usually professionals. My firm is a limited liability partnership. Um, kind of, they typically share office space as a group of professionals. Um, corporations. These are established to protect the investors of a company from being held personally liable. These are what everyone, you know, major corporations. There are two types. A C-Corp is actually taxed twice. You're taxed um, income generated by the corporation itself, and then when you distribute the income in, to the shareholders, that's taxed again. Um, an S-Corp is basically all the corporate um, formalities and protections of liability, except you're only taxed when you do a share, when you um, give the money to the shareholders. Um, Articles and corporation must be filed to the state, and generally, it would be a close for this type of business. It would be a closed corporation, um, and that would be limited to just 20 shareholders. Um, that's usually a closed corporation. Corporation itself is only limited. You know, your liability in the corporation is only so far as what the corporate assets are. Um, limited liability, but. Another th big thing is also protecting the corporate formalities to avoid piercing the corporate veil. If you have a corporation set up and it's, uh, sole, um, it's one shareholder and you move money back and forth between the corporation and your personal assets, you undervalue the corporation, 
you know, things like that, and you're really not complying with any corporate formalities, they'll pierce the corporate veil because they'll just show that it's a sham. You know, it's not really there. It's only there to really protect the liability. And the courts will look beyond that and then go after you personally. So it's very important to maintain your own corporate formalities. And then we have a limited liability company, which is a hybrid business structure. Um, it offers the same liability as a S -corp, or S corp, but it doesn't require as many of the um, corporate formalities. And in order to have an LLC, you must draft a certificate of formation and file it with the state. And pretty much, like I said, when choosing a business structure, you know, talk to your attorney and your accountant. You know, you'll get a good discussion as far as liability and things like that. So, and that's where we're at. And that's my contact info. If you have any questions, you know, don't hesitate to contact me. Um, available for anyone's questions, you know, even after the project's done. Um, and that's pretty much it. Any questions? We'll open it up for discussion. Go ahead. Yeah, just just uh, one discussion. We find we do uh, data mapping, just putting people on the internet. Mm -hmm. So when you get similar type of businesses like lost to both tour, yeah. uh, registering the name is important mm -hmm. because down the road, exactly. similar yeah. products would be very yeah, you definitely want to register the name and comply with all the formalities. Like you said, like Reeves McEwing LLP. We put up LLP that we're a limited liability partnership. There's, you know, everyone knows what our business structure is. Um, you know, Sea Grant Inc. It's a corporation. You know what kind of, cor you know it's a corporation. Um, my mom's business is an LLC. So it's very important to determine the corporate structure. Um, let people know that you are a corporation or there is some protection there. Um, that's a good point that you brought up. In the back. Um, yeah, thinking back to the ADA uh, material for a minute, it occurred to me, if you're operating off the town dock, who, who's responsible for having the ramps and all that good stuff in the reducing shape? Um, generally, it would probably be the town, and there's probably an agreement in, the co in your contract, your birthing contract, um, that establishes liability as to who's responsible for that. Um, it is a municipal dock, so I believe that they are actually required under statute to be ADA compliant to a degree of accessibility um, versus a private dock. Um, Yeah, you would, uh, anything that you, and that's also a good point, you'd want to specifically write out, if you have a um, berth, you'd want to talk to your, um, the owner of the marina or the facilities where you operate um, before you just start having a bunch of tourists come down um, and, and going on board the boat. Because you may need to revise the contract as to actually who is liable. Um, they may not want that responsibility and they may put it on you. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not going to be getting sued in the future if something were to happen, but it will basically, it's, it's, you create an indemnification agreement, basically, that should something happen, you agree to indemnify me for any future issues. Um, with that said, they can still get dragged into the litigation, but it's fairly easy for them to get pulled out. And, um, if there is an indemnification agreement, depending on the terms, um, you would actually want to, um, any of their costs, depending on how it's written, would be borne on you or your insurance company. Um, you'd be paying to actually protect them it's, itself. Um, one final question, uh, having to do with ADA, this would make tide dependent. Tide dependent? Tide dependent. Um, that would be one of the things that would they would definitely take into account. As, as I know, no, I, I understand. Was it 15 foot tide changes up here or something yeah. like that? Yeah. I totally agree. We actually um, down by us, we have a tide change of six feet, and even then, that's a pain in the neck to try and get passengers on and off. So it would definitely be something that you would want to take into consideration when you look into the feasibility issues. Is it feasible to get um, a person with a disability on board the vessel or is it just not feasible at that time? Or another option is you may have to 
say, okay, I'll take you on board, but you must be at my dock at X, because that's when the tide changes. And we need to be back by Y, because that's when we can get you off the vessel. It's working and being able, it's basically working with them um, and being reasonable to, to get them on and off the vessel. Um, you just can't say no, because there's a way you can always kind of play around with it and get it to work, usually. Um, any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you want to switch over to yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Represent. We have about 180 farms up and down the coast. Uh, our members grow uh, shellfish, finfish, and aquatic plants. Um, and I'll give you a couple of examples of how individual members have interacted with the tourism industry. I'll also refer you to there was a governor's task force on aquaculture a bunch of years ago that reviewed the relationship between the tourism industry and aquaculture as two different sectors and how they interrelated. Um, and we got advice on that task force from kind of the heads of the, the three big tourism associations um, in, the, in the state. And then I'll also uh, just close by recounting a couple of personal experiences I've had in other countries. Most of, or a lot of my career has been overseas. Um, and in other countries, the linkage between tourism and aquaculture is actually quite tight, and it has turned out to be a very profitable uh, linkage for both the farmer and for the tourism operator. But here in Maine, um, we have people who are doing the following. We have uh, aquaculture facilities that are used as a stop in a, uh, a tour. So for example, a nature tour that goes out to look at seals or seabirds uses an aquaculture farm as one of the stops on its tour, and they talk about um, how we're farming the oceans and where seafood comes from. We have uh, members that have actually financial arrangements with uh, hunting and fishing recreational guides. Uh, in the case of hunting, it's for sea uh, duck hunting. In the case of recre recreational fishing, it's for striped bass. Uh, guides and they use the structure of the farm as an as a basically a point from which they guide their tours from. So in the case of sea duck hunters, uh, they have a contractual arrangement with a mussel farmer, uh, and that sea duck guide has the ability to guide around that farm, as well as a recreational striped bass fisherman. There are guys who are striped bass guys who will use uh, oyster farms or mussel farms which have structure in the water which attract striped bass as a stop in their daily guide uh, rotation uh, when, they're, when they're guiding for folks. Um, we have folks um, that do, uh, will stop at a farm and then serve as part of a shore lunch later on in their tour products that come off that farm. And so that's a relatively small operation. And then we go to the other extreme. The association has a relationship with a cruise line, one of the smaller cruise lines, American Cruise Lines. We will actually, uh, they will take a stop by one of our farms. That evening, we will put an interpreter on the cruise line. And we will serve the, uh, the product coming off that farm. And that interpreter will give a one hour presentation to the folks who are on that cruise line. Um, about farming the ocean and where those products are. We've we been doing that for two years now. Um, we also have uh, kayaking companies that use our farms as uh, either a stop in a kayaking tour or as part of a self-guided tour. So the association produces a booklet, and I apologize, I don't have any. Uh, it's, a, it's a trifle brochure. Uh, we are out of them and we're reprinting them now, but uh, basically if you're a sea kayaking company and you want a little blurb about aquaculture, whether it's mussel farming or oyster farming or, or fit fish farming, we'll send you some brochures and you can hand that to the people who are going, who you're renting a kayak to, um, and it will explain about what aquaculture is and how that relates to working waterfronts along the coast of Maine. Um, we have done uh, food tours. Most of you probably know that Maine has got an emerging foodie tourism uh, sector. We are hot right now, big time hot nationally. Um, we had, uh, we were one of the uh, first groups that helped found something called Harvest on the Harbor with the uh, Portland Visitors and Convention uh, Center. So the first year we did five events as part of the Harvest on the Harbor. 
featuring our products and, and then uh, partnering with local celebrity chefs about what, uh, how they fit into the kind of foodie scene in Portland. That, um, that foodie scene, that foodie um, tourism connection has now blossomed and uh, we have things like, uh, you've probably heard about the Oyster Festival in Damascata, that's, uh, that's a linkage there. We have a salmon festival in uh, Eastport um, and the Harvest on the Harbor would be kind of the third piece that we, we partner on. I actually personally think there's a lot more opportunity in, in that particular space. I think we have, um, particularly in the shoulder seasons in Maine, our tourism uh, season is getting longer and longer and the foodie connection is a place where people want to go visit a farm, see where their food comes from, understand that it's locally grown, the local food piece. Um, that, is, that is a place where we as growers uh, really are interested in expanding our relationships with tourism uh, companies and, and um, tourism uh, entrepreneurs. Um, and then the final piece, and, and Dana and I have, have worked together on this, is we have done some tours for food writers or for people who are interested in slow food, for example, that kind of stuff. Sea Grant has been great uh, on that end of things where they've actually um, helped facilitate um, people who are in the foodie world from either a writing point of view or from a chef point of view uh, get out on farms and talk about um, what we do as farmers and, and where people can uh, access stuff. I want to put a plug in for something that we are starting which is the main seafood culinary institute. Um, we just put it together as part of a partnership with some chefs out of Portland. It will be uh, a one week session in the summer where we will invite chefs to come to Maine uh, and tour farms and then have every evening we'll have a kind of a master class um, with a, a chef from Maine. So if people are interested in getting in on that, um, I would encourage you to contact me. Uh, we still have, uh, in, a, in a five day week, we still have at least one evening slot open. So if you know chefs that are interested in that kind of stuff, um, we would love to, to find some folks. What we will do is start in Portland and work our way up along the coast uh, during a five day uh, tour and um, We'll see what, how it goes. It's a, we're taking kind of a, a gamble on this. I don't know whether it'll work or not, um, but I hope, I hope it will. And uh, we've got some great chefs from Portland who have agreed to be part of it, so that's kind of exciting. Um, and then finally, uh, just in terms of what people are doing in other places in the world, uh, a good friend of mine, his name is James Ryan. He lives on the west coast of uh, Ireland. He has a tour company that has a 100-foot catamaran. Uh, they, they partner with uh, bus companies, so they come to the west coast of Ireland, they put people on the catamaran, they steam along the coast of Ireland, they visit uh, looking at seabirds and historic castles, and then they visit James Salmon Farm, uh, and they serve a salmon dinner on the way back to the, to the dock. So there's an example of where actually James is a salmon farmer, is the guy who owns the tour company, he's actually internalized uh, that business. Uh, Korea, an abalone farm, wonderful abalone farm, owned by a very entrepreneurial um, um, gentleman and his family. They have a big restaurant. The restaurant has these huge bay windows. They look out over the farm. Uh, when you walk into the restaurant, there's a whole, it's almost like a museum of abalone farming, uh, talking about uh, how to farm abalone. And then the menu is linked to the different forms of abalone they grow in product forms. And, and the servers are all trained in the story about the abalone farm and how that relates to um, how we're going to feed the world. There are some wonderful stories to tell about the linkage between aquaculture and food and food trends. And um, we need to do better than we have. One place I am really interested in, and I have made no progress, and if somebody wants to help me with this, I'd be, I'd be psyched about it, <coughs> server training in restaurants. I don't know how many people are in the restaurant business. Turnover is an issue. It's the same with fish markets, too. You're the guy behind the fish market, you ask him where the fish comes from, 90% of the time they look at you like a deer in the headlights. Uh, so we approached, and unfortunately Dick Groton has just retired from the main restaurant associations, but we approached uh, Dick to do some sort of a server training um, module for them. They have a module that you can go through as a restaurant owner. We'd like to insert into that 
information about Maine seafood and Maine aquaculture. If anybody wants to help me work on that, I'd, I'd sure love to have some work on that and, and help. Because it is, when you go to a restaurant and you ask where the seafood is, I mean, here are the numbers, right? We import over 95% of the seafood that we consume in this country it comes from another country. That means in the state of Maine, when you go to a restaurant, you are statistically more likely to be eating, eating seafood from another country than you are from Maine. That's just a fact. Um, and so uh, if we as local growers and local fishermen can get our story out to the public and talk about why they should buy local, why they should support that, um, and do that through the server community, then I, th I think we will be uh, helping each other and, and help build the brand. But we need, we need training materials and somebody who's willing to engage with the restaurant community for that server training uh, program. And I'll, I'll end there answer any questions or what have you. Yeah, thanks. Well, that's, that's a great um, range of, some, oh, feel free to stand or sit or however you'd like to do it. It's a, it's a great uh, suite of a range of things that, that might be possible. And yeah. so this is, um, this is a little bit of time that we have to, to hear from you, either questions that you might have or ideas or stories that you might have. And just as a, just as a little bit of a background, originally we were about to have a speaker to talk about uh, his lobster tourism business. Well, uh, as it turns out, he couldn't make it, and that's fine. But I'm kind of just as excited to hear this because we've got a little bit of time to kind of wander around about this, this world of what might be possible. Um, and so, what do you think? Ron's chomping at the yeah, Come on, Ron. Now, the Seafood Culinary Institute sounds so great. Now, is it going to be only aquaculture? Or are the wild, the wild catch folks going to get a hand in? We, we would like to include the wild catch. Um, the, the challenge is going to be uh, the amount of time we have and the amount of geography we have mm -hmm. to cover. We have done, um, we have done, I think, five or six tours like this um, previously. Not, you know, they were by invitation only. They were kind of um, smaller tours, and it's expensive, it's really expensive, and uh, it takes a lot of time and energy. I mean, you've got to literally put everybody in a van and drive them from one place to another, then you have to find a restaurant in the evening who's willing to host uh, a, a meal, you've got to get people to donate product. Um, so we're, it's, we still got a lot to work out on, to be honest with you, but I, I, in my mind, this will not be successful unless this features Main seafood, period. Period. The yeah. whole and that's, I had to do that with shrimp this year, won't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm kidding. <laughs> that actually brings up two points, two really quick points. This is a great way to highlight seafood and forget about the division of whether it's caught or grown. This is a good way to do generic connections to Maine produce seafood. And the, the second really quick thing I will say is that in Maine, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a lobster. <laughs> and you all know people who fish or farm or do both or something like that. The person in Chicago doesn't know that. The person in Las Vegas or New York City doesn't know that. And for those people who are in the field, you're rock stars. That's why the TV shows are out there. That's gold. Uh, well, that's money. Uh, I'm sorry. That, quick digression. How many people are you going to have on the uh, Maine Seafood Culinary Institute? Trip up the we think we can reasonably handle uh, between 12 and 14 maps to begin with. And that's because we got to find, and this is my challenge, I need to find venues at night where I can conduct a master class but have chefs engage in that. So this is our first, our first run through is going to be for chefs only. It's not going to be for the general public. I, so I'm targeting people who want to talk to each other chef to chef. Um, and uh, that's a, you know, that's, I, I don't think we can get a lot bigger than that. And, and you know, uh, chefs are complicated people. Uh, <laughs> they, they are. Uh, they, they have opinions. They want to have space to express those opinions. Uh, part of this is um, not over, overstepping the number of people in one room. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> yes. Pastor, are you looking? Are you looking to have, let's say, ten restaurants to let these chefs come in and work in their restaurant? Or what, what's your? No. So um, we have uh, we've identified three, and I actually I'm still shy one. I need one more place. We've identified three places along the coast that actually have a fairly large 
um, kitchen that, that um, we can get people into and let them cook and talk to each other amongst themselves. So uh, in two instances, one is a community kitchen, one is actually a kitchen which is um, associated with uh, a vineyard. Uh, so um, they have a, a kitchen. So there's a nice opportunity there for some pairing with main wines, which we're going to do. Um, and then the third instance is a restaurant um, that's a commercial restaurant and has agreed to kind of set aside some time and it's a it's a it's a kitchen which is actually I should say it's associated with a bed and breakfast so it's not a it's not like a main street restaurant it's a bed and breakfast but they've agreed to put put an evening aside for us and the chef from that from that B&B will be part of that uh, when you're running a commercial farm and somebody swings by and stops, and Dick will know this, I mean, and they start to ask questions and you're trying to do what you got to get done to get the <laughs> truck loaded, it's a pain in the you-know-what. Uh, so it is, I mean, it's not, it's not easy to do, um, particularly in the instance, in the case of um, recreational fishing and recreational hunting uh, guides, I, I know there are instances where there is cash exchange. There's always a possibility for a chef to be delighted by that aquaculture and go contract with you guys for a New Jersey restaurant or whatever. Well, no, that's happened in some of our in some of our food. We did about um, eight or nine years ago. We did a series of food rider tours, and on those food rider tours, there were also a couple of chefs, and we absolutely know that, that those folks are sourcing from the from the farms that they went to, to tour. Yeah. Oh, yeah, please, Chris. What's the legality? of serving an oyster on the half shell to a visitor to your oyster farm. Can you give it to them? Can you sell it to them? Currently, can you not check it? Currently, you can give them something, but you cannot sell it. And there is pending legislation that we have cooperated with the Department of Marine Resources. It will, be, it will go through in this session to allow you to sell off the farm. You have to be in compliance with, you know, some sanitary conditions, obviously, or whatever. But you, you will be able to sell directly from the farm. That is, and that's something that we have not had in Maine, but places like Massachusetts, uh, Rhode Island. I don't know if Connecticut has that ability or not. I'm not sure about Connecticut, but there are other states that have had that ability, and so we've we've worked. And the, and the department deserves a lot of credit uh, for being willing to consider that and, and move that. And but actually, before I forget, I want to just give a shout out to, D, to the Department of the Coast Guard. Um, I don't get a chance to say this publicly very often, but I want to thank you on behalf of our guys, because you guys are on the water all the time, and if one of our guys get in trouble, you're the guys who bail them out, and we really appreciate that. So thank you very much. Experience Maritime Maine is a program that started with a partnership with Maine Office of Tourism and Maine Maritime Museum in 2012. And it was, uh, program that was used to advertise events in Maine that were tied to Maritime Maine. Um, looking from events from the coast of Maine all the way from the south up to the north, uh, highlighting different events in that time. Um, Maritime, Maine, Maritime Maine Maritime Museum was 50 years old that year, and some of the events were around that. Others were large events on the coast from the um, Lobster Festival in Rockland up to the Pirate Festival up in Eastport. Um, the Maritime Maine at that point um, advertised with a brochure, a website, and some radio advertising, and also had a website that folks throughout Maine, throughout coastal Maine, could send in their events to be advertised on that site. Um, Experience Maritime Maine in 2013 has a little bit of a different look. Um, Penobscot Marine Museum is taking the lead on that. And we're working with a group of partners to look at how we can create a website, reinvigorate the website, really, to be not event-based, but site-based or institution-based or experience-based, so that folks throughout the maritime main industry can get the word out about your products or your industry or experiences that you're offering and use the site as a vehicle for that. We're in a beginning stages of this project, so what we envision happening this year is the development of a website. Um, Terry Bonneville of Bonneville Consulting here in Belfast is designing that website for us. Um, we're also going to produce a, rap, a rack card and a Facebook page, 
And we're hoping to involve folks from all the main coastal regions in this effort. Um, we're working right now with a group of partners. There's um, some folks in this room that are partners. Natalie is on that. Alvin in the back is on that group. Um, and Mike is on that group as well. And we're working to really get down the basics of what this website will look like. We'd like the website to be directed at folks that are coming to Maine, looking for these experiences, but also folks that are living in Maine or in the rest of New England wanting to experience, experience these tours or eating establishments or um, visits to the aquaculture farms, all of the things that you've been talking about. We want them to have a place that's central that they can go and look for that and then a place to drive them from that site to your businesses so that what you have to offer becomes more accessible. Um, the way that we're doing that, as I said, we're starting small with a website and a rat card and a Facebook page. Um, right now we're in the process of developing what that content will be and forming teams to talk about how to get that content out there. The content will advertise different, um, we'll, we'll really deal with different areas of focus and I'm going to read you, I didn't, I'm not on the content team, so I'm going to read you the different areas that the content team talked about. Um, it can be anything from maritime history to education to marine ecology, science and technology, fisheries and aquaculture, boat building, sailing and boating, maritime art, coastal features, lighthouses that you were mentioning, Astrid, people wanting to come and see that, island life, food, nature and wildlife preservation, or issues that are being considered by folks in the maritime industries in Maine. So really a wide-reaching site that talks about all of these things um, and that's able to not only um, help you to get your sites out in front of people, but also to do featured stories on any of these topics. So it will be a site that folks can go to for information, um, but also can go to for specifics. Folks that come and say, I really want to go and have a Maine lobster, where can I do that? There'll be a way for them to find out on this site, but there'll also be a way for them to find out about the lobster industry and what's going on with that in Maine. So we're in the process of doing that now. Um, Kathy, do you, Kathy is a major player in this, in organizing this. Do you wanna I just add wanted a bit to, to that? say that part of it is, um, you were talking about selling Maine lobster or Maine seafood. And what we're trying to do, um, more than just make another place where everything is listed, is to create a feeling about Maine as a, mar a place for maritime experiences. Um, we want to we want to create the romance of the maritime experience of Maine, um, and it's not I think just for people, you know the MOT is wants to bring people from out of state, but I think a lot of tourism and a lot of money is to be made by those of us in state. I mean we're here, um, we go places. I vacation on Vinyl Haven and at Moosehead Lake, and so I think there's a lot to be um, uh, to, to give to the people of the state of Maine to about our our rich maritime heritage and and uh, present and future. So I, I think that we're interested in gathering information um, and hopefully um, having some contacts in each region, each coastal region, that folks can contact for information about that. In the meantime, um, please give us a holler at Penobscot Marine Museum. Um, my email there is lodge at pmm-maine.org. Kathy's is kgoldner at the same. You can just go to the Penobscot Marine Museum site and find out how to contact us there. But this group is getting going now, it's getting underway now, and we hope to, in the spring, have a site up, a website up that we can um, have folks be ready to access and learn about the American region. So we'll be gathering information right. and reaching out to a lot of you, um, but please reach out to us if you want to be on the mailing list or be involved in any way. We would love that. Um, we have a, a kind of big group. There are about 28 people, different organizations um, that have come to the first meeting, and um, the next meeting will be at the end of January. So just um, let me know if you want to be on that mailing list.
we also have a number of tourism regions that are sending representatives to these meetings as well. So there'll be a number of points that you can contact to find out more, more about this and get involved. So the other thing I wanted to say uh, that the museum is involved with, and I'm not sure how many of you this would uh, apply to, but um, there's a volunteer organization in the state called the Maine Motor Coach Network, which is a group of, it started out very small, it's now there are hundreds of people, um, usually 30 or 40 come to any given meeting, but um, it's a group that got together to market Maine to the motor coach uh, tour industry all around the country. And we, the museum happens to be, I think they call it motor coach ready. Um, there's something about, you know, obviously you have to have a parking lot big enough to fit a bus, you have to have bathrooms, and there are some various things that are all on actually the main tourism website. Um, Certain towns are more um, ready for these buses than other towns. I think Belfast, for instance, doesn't really have parking facility for, for them. But it's a wonderful group of people. There are a lot of hotels represented, but when I joined, um, they said, you know, people don't come to Maine just to stay in our hotels. So they, uh, they want other industries represented. Um, again, if you want to uh, contact me, I'd be happy to um, put you in touch with the people with the Maine Motor Coach Network. They actually bring tour, tour guides here. They take them around. They plan tours for them. Um, they're very active. The Maine Tourism is also very active in this, too. So once you get out and into a group like that, um, it's a wonderful thing to make connections with other people. Um, and also let Maine Tourism know who you are. Because in my experience with um, Maine Tourism, they really want to hear from people. They have a website, you, if you have events, or you know, if you start a tour, um, you can log in on their website and put your events there. They want pictures, they want your stories. So um, definitely a great group to work with. As an innkeeper, uh, and something that I guess relates to you, you, you all have a chance to be associated with or close to a chamber of commerce or some sort of a business association, whether you're in a nonprofit protecting the bay or whether you're working hard trying to get some seafood out of the ocean. Um, <clears throat> the money that we pay as taxpayers when you eat at a restaurant, that 8% tax or that 8% uh, when you stay at some inn in the state of Maine, a portion of that goes into the uh, marketing fund run by the Maine Office of Tourism. And it's about 15% of the total money that goes in there, which is the last year maybe $10 million. Some portion of that money comes down to the regions. Now there's eight tourism regions in Maine, and there's four coastal tourism regions. So there's the Beaches region, just south of Portland, there's Greater Portland, and then just somewhere north of Freeport, uh, I'm not quite sure where the line is, is the mid-coast. And the mid-coast goes from north of Freeport, <clears throat> so it certainly includes Brunswick, all the way up to uh, Searsport. And, it's, and the Penobscot River is sort of the boundary there, the, the northern flank of the mid-coast. And then down east in Acadia is uh, Hancock County and uh, Washington County. So. Um, this money is something that we use to help promote our regions or a portion of it. So the state runs, we put out a brochure, the main office of tourism does, to promote the state to the rest of the world. And the office of tourism, which is about five full-time employees, goes to travel shows uh, in Europe and throughout this country to attract people here. Um, and then, uh, we have two products that I think might be of interest to you. One is a website, visitmaine.com or visitmeme.com. Uh, that's being redone, uh, but it's supposed to be online and, and re renovated uh, in uh, February. Uh, and the other thing is uh, Welcome Maine Training. And it was put on by the, um, the University of Maine and the Office of Tourism and it's hospitality training. So if you know someone 
we were talking, Sebastian was talking about training uh, people that serve food to be coherent about, you know, the seafood they're eating. Well, waitresses and waiters are, are front people for us in a lot of things, and, and they're front people for our entire industry. You know, by that I mean the visitor business. Um, so Welcome Me is the name of it, Welcome Me. If you look that up, you go into it. It's about a 45-minute self-paced tutorial. You can take it yourself. Uh, you'll find you'll be interested if you have any interface with people who visit with the hospi in hospitality. It's worth going to that website, and you can get a little certificate from the Maine Tourism Association that says you're a graduate of that. But it's just a small example of some of the stuff we're doing to uh, help us promote ourselves. Uh, and then finally, uh, the Experience Maritime Maine, we're working with that project. You know, if we can get people in Maine, I'm prejudiced because I live near the coast, so they can ski in Colorado all they want, I don't care. <laughs> but uh, here, you know, it's the lobster, seafood, lighthouse, blueberry. Um, and, uh, and then uh, Natalie's doing the, uh, the Down East Fisheries Trail. I don't know if she brought any of those maps with us, but it's a super project. Uh, in the long run, it'd be nice if we could figure out how to integrate more commercial advertising into those things. But if you have a chance to be a member of your local chamber of commerce, some of this money that is collected by the state is filtered back down to the local area to promote uh, Owl's Head, to promote Searsport, to promote Bucksport, and uh, to promote you and your business and to help you you know, sell, move, whatever it is you're selling, moving, or cajoling, so you can do more of it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's great to see this collection of people here. You know, people that wear rubber boots for a living, you know, have my heart. So, uh, anyway, uh, it's good to see this cross-section. We've got some folks from government, we've got some folks from academia, and we've got a lot of uh, good, hard-working people here. So, you know, maybe we, I think we'll, we'll do something better. And uh, you're the start of it, so thank you. Maine Up in Orono has an ongoing list that you can um, access, I think, through their media and marketing um, offices of experts at the university and what topics they address. Um, it's not probably a group that you could access if you want to have someone on your boat like every day or even every week, but if you want to specialize, this is this is the, the week that we're going to have a, a birding expert on our tour. You, know, you could possibly connect with that resource. And in that same vein, um, I work at the Lobster Institute, as you know, and we're a nonprofit within the university, kind of. So we do fundraising on our own, and we've put a couple of um, events together. One in Canada, it's called Lobster Academy. And it's along the same lines as what Sebastian was talking about with the, with the Culinary Institute. We bring people within the lobster industry to learn more about everything to do with lobsters. And our role is with the biology and talking a little bit about management and uh, different sectors within the industry. But we also do that um, for non-industry, <laughs> we call it Lobster College. And with that, we connect with um, different bed and breakfasts in different areas. And then it's a full weekend uh, immersion in everything and anything to do with lobsters. And we've, um, we used to do that every year, and then we found our reach, uh, our marketing budget is basically zero, so our reach had pretty much exhausted it itself. But if there's a bed and breakfast or a tour boat that wants to bring in someone that has the expertise in the biology and all those uh, ecological questions and, and behind the scenes industry, other than the harvesters, uh, we feel like we can partner with others to do that. And then we can draw on, on your uh, clientele, you can draw on our, our contact list and so forth. So those kinds of partnerships are available not only within uh, the fishing and the tourism, but, but with the um, universities and other organizations and educational organizations like that. One thing we noticed this year is that when uh, a carload of tourists would come in, they'd have a carload of these things with them. So if you want to see what your area looks like to the tourists that's traveling, 
uh, get one of these or find out your kid or your grandparents that have one of these things. <laughs> Take a look at your own area and see which businesses are working with the social marketing tools because all the hotels are looking for things to do to keep people heads in beds is the big game out there that spends all the money in the marketing. And if you can provide that, you'll find a lot of teamwork between a lodging place that would want to uh, represent your activity, your things to do. There's also tons of sites that are out there. Uh, TripAdvisor, Yelp, Foursquare, uh, Facebook that show location-based activities. And this is a really good place to be. Nobody wants to be called a tourist. And I think one of the beginning conversations here should be, you know, we're inviting these people. They're either guests or, you know, use the word that you want to use. But when you label somebody a tourist and you're talking to them, a lot of times they think that's, that's offensive. We don't want to be tourists. We want to be um, participants. We want to be explorers. We want to be all those different things. But consider it, because I've heard it said several times, and I think if people from out of state were sitting in this room, they, it sounds like we're callous. And that isn't it. We really do want to treat people like we care that they're here. You know, that whole, it's tourist season, let's shoot them. <laughs> as much as we can appreciate it. We need to shift the conversation a little bit so that when we're bringing them to a farm or to a boat or anything else like that, they're getting that piece of personal attention that they can't get with a big company. You know, working with a insurance provider that will really, you know, show you, okay, this is your policy, this is how it gets set up, and this is what you're covered for. And a good insurance provider will go through all that because you, you're better off spending a little bit now than to get, you know, a complaint in the mail that someone's been injured on your vessel and now all of a sudden they want all this money. Because that's what the insurance is there for, you know. And, perfect example like for us um, we deal with a lot of fishermen someone gets hurt on your boat you have insurance on your boat your insurance provider will hire attorneys to help represent you and I always look at my clients not as the insurance provider but as the fisherman it's it's the gentleman that I represent I represent you know mr. X mr. you know Y I don't represent the insurance company at that point because I'm really dealing with you guys, and that's really what your insurance is there for. It's not to, you know, you don't want to skip out essentially because you do want to be correct. I mean, it's very difficult when you try and tell someone, hey, guess what? You're out of insurance coverage, you know, in case something does happen. Because right then and there, now you're out of pocket for whatever the costs are associated with it. And usually it's only a couple of extra hundred dollars. I know it's a lot, but depending on the policy of your coverage. Yeah, because I called about it and um, it would increase my insurance if I was to have to take the boat. But see, the problem with the tourism needs being taking mm -hmm. people on a boat is I want to fish primarily. Yeah. I don't really want it. You know, but it's a, it would be another way of earning an income on yeah. the boat and it would buffer against the changes in the, mm -hmm. the resource that we're seeing. And, I mean, it's great right now, but how is that going to go for? Yeah. And other cost things, you know, if I could take somebody um, a couple of days a week, it would be all offset, people would be ready. But my idea was actually, because I did my class three license, was to actually have somebody and come and do the hands on, okay. like the adventure tourism. Really working teaching. experience where you would actually come on the boat and you would be like the secondary stern man mm -hmm. or you know and yeah. it yeah. and the issues that I really see with that is you're basically to use the term having a greenhorn on board the boat operating the traps right which is something that you really wouldn't want to do and from an insurance perspective that's something that could be very dangerous depending on what they're actually doing. Um, are they operating um, the hydraulics? Are they near the lines? Or are they just, okay, they're in the back and they're pulling the lobsters out of traps and helping you, I guess, ban them, you know, things like that. 
And, and like I said, talk to your insurance provider. They probably will tell you, all right, but it's going to be X is the cost, and you know this is what you know they can and cannot do. Um, and then also I'd walk through your operation so they so they'll go. Well, you don't want to go over to this this part of the of the. It'll be the policy limits. Part, yeah, course. it would be generally the policy limits what it can and cannot do. Um, and then another thing that also you can look into. Um, you know, they'll tell you exactly what you know. And then also another big thing is also keep in mind and talk to uh, DMR because where does it draw the line that now they're out here, you know, they're helping yeah. you. Well, I had my, or um, the boat. my niece here from Australia and her girlfriend here. And uh, we actually worked it out pretty well because he's my stern man. And so I have my class here, so I can have two stern men. So I told, if, and I had this problem when I had couples on the boat, <coughs> that everybody likes to touch the lobsters. So I'll show them, like, okay, this is how you do it. them. And then somebody else, they'll see it going on and they can't keep their hands. So what we do, <laughs> we have camera control. <laughs> everybody has it. Somebody out of three people has to be holding on to the camera at all points. So we had, you know, Jasmine, my niece, and she was learning with, and her girlfriend was on the stern, and then they switched off, and then he was on the stern, and we had the three girls running the boat, which was, <laughs> you know, but, but it's that controlling that, which that's not an issue, but it's just whether you're, is it too much to, you know, and but see, that way you can do a whole day trip. Yeah. Um, and you're not doing that thing, because I can't see where it would be fine. Or, to, 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 you know, two hour trips or whatever. Uh, and if they can't do anything, they're on the boat all day, it makes for a <coughs> Yeah, a little more like that. Yeah, really it's, you know, talk to the insurance providers. Right. You know, see what they will and will not let you do. I mean, each insurance company will allow you to do more things for, you know, the premiums and shop around. And really, one of the things that you should understand is, all right, he's at a less, you know, it's a lesser rate, and he's allowing me to do more things. Why? You, you know what I mean? It's it's kind of like, um, you know, I save fifteen percent. Why did you save fifteen percent? What are you really giving up? You know, in the catch twenty two. You know, am I paying for certain things that I may want down the road, or am I? You know what I mean? It's some something along, you know. You know, go through everything and really just talk to them and um, you know because that's the whole point is to protect you they don't want to put you out of business but if something were to happen they want to be able to protect you it's very difficult when you're their attorney and you turn around and tell someone hey your policy limits are up so we have I have an issue with that right now with a client it's unfortunately had he spent a couple hundred dollars he could have gotten a lot more insurance coverage <coughs> so that's the thing that you really want to investigate and look into because you don't want to be left you know paying out of pocket because now it's you know it can get expensive with legal fees and you know how much um, you know, what is this going to cost me and things like that so if I want to go see kayak and I can and I can go to another site and find out if I want to take an overnight green jammer trip I can't go anywhere in the state of Maine to find out whether easily if I wanted to do a lobster boat trip, you know, say a bunch of lobster boat trips on the state of Maine. So the day boat business is really badly organized as an activity. I could go to Camden and find out if there's day boat stuff in there, but I can't find out, you know, easily up and down the coast. Um, and with that in mind, those folks also have, have jumped through all these insurance groups already. So if you've got, if you have an operator, you know, a buddy in Camden Harbor that's running, you know, 12 passenger day boats, you know, talk to find out who their insurance provider is. And then go talk to insurance providers. Or that might be something if there's a bunch of folks in the lobster industry that are interested in, you know, maybe adding this little side on this might be something that the uh, Down East Lobsterman's Association could do to talk to some of these things so that, so that not everybody has to do it all of all at once but uh, I, I mean I can see there's a potential a lot of there's a lot of expertise that's already in the state of being happened uh, you know I, I mean I 
when I was running a, a friendship, Jesus, I was uh, scary. I think about all the things that could have gone, <laughs> could have gone wrong when I was running a friendship as a six pack. There are some pretty creative things out there. Mm -hmm. And I guess the, my suggestion would be to do that exploration and ask those questions. One of the examples was a guy in Alaska taking people out long line, and they are hired as a crewman for a day. Okay. Hooks flying all over the place. Talk about potential for danger, but adventure and people want to do that stuff. So there's a guy who um, figured out the insurance and then the, the whatever rates. Well, he was hired, so maybe it wasn't a rate kind of thing. Worked out a situation that worked for that particular business. And so it probably pays to, you know, wander around in that insurance land a little bit to kind of find out what, what might work. Because you, you never know what might work. Well, uh, that example aside, there were there were other ones as well. I mean, the one, if you get a class two or a class three license, being able to carry other people. That was a thing that we definitely consulted with the Department of Marine Resources on. And it's, it's a novel way to envision that lobster tour as opposed to having people come all over and you haul traps and they don't even get to handle the bugs when they come out because people want to participate. That's one thing that that really built into me a lot. People want the experience. Well, the touch and, so far the lobster and the other piece about when, when we were sort of at the research phase of kind of looking at what what's already been done, we called a bunch of people who do these kinds of tours all over the place and talked to them and Whenever I asked the insurance question, it never got the same answer. I got answers ranging from, oh, when I went from being a commercial fisherman to bringing people on my boat for a few days, my premium went up. I had one guy tell me, it was a guy in Maine, I'm not going to mention names, he told me his premiums went up by 100 bucks. And I had another guy on the phone the very next day, very same question, who said they went up 2,500 bucks. So it totally depends what what conversation they're having with their insurance broker, what they're offering, what the, I mean, there's, unfortunately, when we, when we went into this research project, before we even hired Scott, we figured, oh, we'll hire a law person and they can just kind of, we can create a fact sheet and here will be all the answers that we can feed people, but it's just, it, you, you have to shop it around and, and talk to them. It's clear that there's a lot of interest in the potential for linking these two industries. Um, it's not an easy road to hope necessarily. Did I say that expression right? <laughs> um, but uh, but for those who want to get into it, there are resources. Um, it's clear to me that we need to do a little bit more work, kind of teasing out these insurance questions. Um, it seems like we people have raised some really good questions, and we don't necessarily have all the answers on the insurance front. So we need to do a little more work on that front. But our role is to meet with businesses one-on-one, -on -one, talk with them about what their goals are, and then help connect them to the resources at the state level or within the community to help them meet those goals. And that could be anything from um, helping to grow their workforce, or if they have regulatory issues, connecting them with the right uh, people within DEP or Department of um, Fisheries. Uh, Fisheries. Fish, Fish calls it now, yeah. <laughs> um, and so that's, you know, we pull the, the right people to the table. If they need financing, we may pull somebody from FAME and pull somebody from CEI or the local bank together to talk about what kind of package we can put together. Um, but if you want to add? Anything. Whatever your needs are, we're interested in learning what they are and then trying to help you find out what the solutions might be. We can't always guarantee answers that you're going to want to hear, but we're going to get you answers so that you can move through some things that you may have in mind and what you'd like to try and do, and part of which is strategic planning. We really will provide you with <coughs> excuse me, access to people who are trained to help you <coughs> formulate strategic plans to move forward with your ideas. And this is at no cost. Your tax dollars already pay these people. So that's usually the first one of the first things to do is sit down with you either by phone or face to face and learn about what your needs and wants are, and then move forward with that. We we don't work in isolation. We bring in colleagues from different state agencies and other resources federal, state, and local. Make sense? We do a lot of networking. Um, part of our mission is to get out to functions um, where we can connect with businesses and other resource partners to let them know who we are and what we do. Uh, and then an awful lot of time, as Christine said, we are meeting one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we do uh, split up the state. Um, so there's a lot of uh, road travel, but we communicate, email, phone uh, as well. 
just interesting, this is a particular interest to me because I started my career as an admiralty attorney um, years ago, um, and I won't say how many, in, uh, in Detroit, where I grew up in Michigan, and then for almost 17 years I was the chamber director in Moot Bay Harbor, so worked with a lot of, and with the Department of Tourism a lot. So, um, and I currently have worked with quite a few seafood um, processor folks that are either um, growing or, or starting up, and um, <coughs> I've been attending some of the aquaculture advisory committee meetings, um, which have been very, very helpful. So, um, all that, all the meetings and things that we go to kind of fill in into our databank so that when we're meeting with um, resource providers, we help connect them with other people or with businesses. So we do a lot of business to business um, networking too. So um, it's just, if you have to remember one thing, remember to call the department um, and they will connect you with whomever is the most appropriate for your, for your uh, location. We have cards. <laughs> you start with us and we'll help you find out where you need to go. <coughs> And this is great. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. Thanks for coming. Yep. And remember Phil. Phil's awesome. <laughs> uh, obviously our perspective on this is from an aquacultural perspective. Um, you know, we run an oyster farm. Uh, but I'll definitely try to um, kind of cast a more generalist slant on it, um, you know, and talking about the way that you can kind of integrate uh, this type of thing into, you know, like Dana was saying, your core business. Um, because it does, there's definitely a give and take there, and we've had successes and we've had failures. A um, little background where uh, we started as an oyster farm, primarily, uh, we still are an oyster farm, we just have a penchant for getting involved with things that we probably have no business being involved in. Um, <laughs> this is probably one of them, but uh, we are involved. Uh, you know, we have some restaurants in Boston, and uh, we also have a wholesale company that we now distribute uh, 60 or so different varieties of oysters and clams and scallops and other, and other things to around uh, directly to 400 chefs around the country. Um, so definitely have our hands full. Um, we, we run a nonprofit foundation also uh, that supports aquaculture as a means of, uh, of, of efficient protein production and sustainable protein production uh, in impoverished communities worldwide. So we have a project in Haiti and a project in Zanzibar. Um, again, I have no business being in Haiti, but uh, I've ended up there somehow. Um, anyhow, uh, there's kind of two different tacks that we take with the, um, with the, the tourism and the kind of opening our farm to the public. We're 45 minutes from Boston, so we've kind of been thrust into this. Uh, it's just there's such a demand there for people, you know, really local people coming down from the city and then, you know, Boston has a hub for uh, lots of travelers. Our restaurant in Kenmore Square is in a hotel, so we get an immense amount of interest from uh, international customers that end up at the hotel, they eat the restaurant, they want to come see the production side of it. Um, so uh, another way we got thrust into this is that probably, I guess, four, four or five years ago now, we did a, uh, a, a big spread of feature in Food & Wine magazine where we hosted some of the editorial staff uh, on the farm and, and put on a dinner for them uh, out on this float, uh, which I'll get to. But obviously having that run, we didn't even think that um, you know, the whole world would basically want to come and replicate that experience on the farm. Uh, so we kind of had to put it up on the website and start trying to uh, make that experience available for the public. Um, so really we have two different types, uh, like I was saying, two different types of ways that we do this. Uh, one is the kind of informational tour, uh, and the other is the, is the hospitality experience. Uh, the first one I'll show you here is the hospitality experience. Uh, that little shack on the water at Duxbury Bay, uh, we call that the Oysterplex because we model it after the Googleplex out in Palo Alto. It's extremely <laughs> high tech. Um, we didn't have quite as much VC funding behind us as Google did when they started out, but uh, it does the job. So it's a, it's a little foreshortened in that image, but it's, a, it's actually a 40-foot hut um, with another 40-foot float hanging off the back. Uh, it is the headquarters of our main farm in Duxbury Bay, so it is a working oysterplex, um, whatever that may be. Uh, and uh, you know we clean it up and we use it uh, on the weekends to host these dinners. Uh, we call them float dinners. Uh, so <laughs> this is obviously the cleanest the Oysterplex has ever been. I don't even think it actually gets this clean for the dinners anymore. Um, but this is part of the photography from the food and wine piece. Uh, and basically what it is is it's a, it's a trumped up lobster bake. Uh, you know, we bring people out to the farm, we give them a tour, we try to time it up with low tide so they can go out and pick their own oysters. 
Uh, we bring all the oysters back to the oyster plex, uh, talk them through how we would go kind of sort it out, and then we put on this, this meal with, um, with lobster and chowder that we bring down from the restaurant and, uh, and you know, all sorts of other goodies. Uh, we do wine pairings, we bring in wine sponsors. Uh, there's a company called Chateau de Clan, which is a rosé uh, importer, and, uh, and they've been kind enough to sponsor the dinners that we've had for uh, the last few years. Next picture. Um, we had a lot of support from the restaurant in Boston. Uh, this is Jeremy Sewell, a uh, guy from York actually, who is our, uh, our executive chef uh, for both of our restaurants and, uh, and his own restaurant over in Brookline. So um, we're able to actually bring down, you know, the chowder, couscous, you know, things like that, the kind of accoutrement that we don't, that we're not able to harvest right from Duxbury Bay uh, to build in around the dinner uh, with, with his help. And uh, that gentleman left is Skip, who Dana was talking about. Um, group shot. Everyone's having fun. Um, you know, see the lobster cooker out there. And, uh, yeah. So now, <laughs> this is CJ. <laughs> CJ uh, is a uh, former truck driver of ours, uh, who's now known around the, the city of Boston as the Oyster Dude. Uh, he goes around promoting uh, our brand. Uh, we do a lot of raw bars at charity events and things like that. And CJ is our kind of main shucker and brand ambassador, if you will. Uh, that's making him sound a little bit more official than he probably is, but, um, but he is quite valuable. So it was natural for CJ to progress into the role of tour guide. So now we're transitioning into, out of that kind of hospitality experience into something that's much more educational and, uh, and also more bare bones. So this is basically taking people, uh, groups of six or 12 people, whether it's one or two boats, um, you know, again, trying to stay with the six pack limit, um, out onto the farm and explain to them uh, about what we do and the environmental benefits and uh, you know, the chefs that buy our oysters and kind of all these questions. The neat thing about that is that we get a really good mix for these, uh, for these tours of local people uh, because for local people that are out on the bay, maybe on you know, Saturday and Sunday, water skiing or whatever, and they see our gear out there or, or they live on the, on the coast and they see, uh, you know, they see us out there in the middle of February you know, uh, harvesting and they wonder what the heck we're doing and how this kind of plays into their community and the local economy and everything like that. Um, so there's this mystery around aquaculture and uh, and I know from even before I got really involved with it you, you know and certainly not I haven't I haven't been involved with fish farming and things like that so uh, you know I used to sail uh, professionally and I was up here actually working on the wind jammers in um, in Camden for uh, for a number of years and we'd sail up the coast and I'd see fish farms and things like that and I knew there were fish farms but I didn't know what the heck was going on so I know that kind of that feeling of, of seeing the gear out there and knowing that something cool is happening but but wanting to know more, not knowing really where to go. Uh, so to be able to open the farm up to local people on a regular basis through the summer season is really valuable, uh, you know, not only just for the money that it brings in, but also for the kind of uh, community outreach, you know, upland landowners, things like that. These are issues that, uh, that you know, everyone in the industry runs into from time to time. So the more buy-in that you can get from the local community, uh, you know, the, the healthier the coexistence is between you and your neighbors. and uh, and, and, and you know, really that's best case scenario. In order to achieve that, you have to kind of open the book and let people in and uh, you know, let people join you in the kind of, all the cool stuff about oysters and not just the fact that you know, our gear is in their view. So um, that's, that's been really valuable. The other uh, aspect of it is bringing people to the farm from the Midwest. Um, we had a group of, uh, of foreign tourists, of like 60 people come down one time. Um, these are people who have no exposure to, to oyster farming whatsoever. And that's cool in its own right because one, you're kind of spreading the gospel of aquaculture, uh, you know, a bit further afield. But two, just kind of seeing the look on their faces of I can't believe this is happening, um, you know, is is pretty valuable, uh, you know, in and of itself. So, um, you know, taking someone out into the middle of Duxbury Bay, standing on the flat, uh, you know, with nothing around you but water and mud um, for miles and miles, picking up an oyster and shucking it and eating it. Uh, you know, while it seems commonplace to us, is a pretty mind-blowing experience to, uh, you know, someone who may have asked on the way out there what lake we were in. So, um, <laughs> you know, those are definitely questions that you get. So, um, so again, these are the tours, more bare bones, uh, walking on the flat. They include a visit to the Oysterplex, but 
generally while the farm crew is still working. Uh, you know, this is not on the weekends. So uh, <laughs> this is one of the considerations that I'll get to of the kind of disruption to your core business of having people here, um, which definitely the farm crew is amenable to it on some days and some days not so much. This is Gardner, our farm manager, on one of his amenable days. <laughs> and uh, yeah, another group of students that we've got out and waiters out there uh, in the summertime. And that's it for pictures. Um, so uh, that's just kind of a broad overview of the, the two kind of kinds of, uh, of outreach that we do. Um, like I said, we've had, we've had successes and we've had failures. Um, some of the successes, uh, you know, again, touching on this kind of opening the, the, the story and the experience to people who may not have access to it, is you get uh, incredible brand advocates that leave. You know? So the number one value is, and it's been, I know it's been brought up today, is that no matter what the people end up paying, you know, or, 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 or what you get out of it from a monetary compensation standpoint, what you, what you do get is people who go forth into the world and not only will end up buying your product, um, you know, for us, it's extremely advantageous because a lot of the way our business is set up is reciprocal. You know, these are people who will go eat at the restaurant, uh, they'll order from us online, and they'll, uh, you know, they'll go out and tell their friends about it, you know, back in uh, Santa Monica or whatever, and they'll go into Water Grill in LA, see our oysters on the menu, and, you know, and pick the Island Creeks. Uh, so there's this amazing web of advocacy that kind of flows for forth from this experience. And while we work really hard on the website, we work really hard on the customer service and the design of the restaurants. Uh, ultimately, the farm is at the core of all of that. You know, it's the real thing that gives the, uh, the ability to kind of all the abstraction and all the different expressions of the brand uh, to bring people into the farm and let them experience that firsthand. There's really nothing that compares to that. So the, the, the more the merrier, uh, you know, in that regard. Uh, and then also just, you know, more broadly is they're advocates for the industry itself. Um, you know, our foundation is set up to basically promote aquaculture and all of the good things about it, you know, that it can be, uh, y y you know, a protein source that's actually a net benefit to the environment where it's grown, you know, that it's extremely cheap to produce and can feed, you know, you know we're not feeding the world with $5 oysters at La Berna Dent, but, um, but we are with, you know, tilapia that can be grown at a feed conversion ratio of 1.4 to 1. Um, so, you know, messages like that uh, can then go forth and, you know, we use that as a platform to kind of spread the good word about aquaculture. Um, the other good thing uh, is obviously leveraging downtime. The weekend float dinners are, uh, are great because the farm crew doesn't work on the weekends. The farm is otherwise dormant. Uh, you know, everyone's out lobstering, you know, they all have rec permits or whatever. Um, so it's a good way to kind of put our resources to use in, uh, during a time where really we'd be getting nothing else out of them. Um, and then obviously there's the monetary compensation. Um, and this is a bit of a sticky issue. Um, and it's something that we've gone back and forth on of the pricing of these experiences. Um, you know, you can make a fair amount of money doing it. Uh, you know, we were charging, I think the last price that we were charging was $3,000 for a, uh, a 12 person dinner on the float. Uh, so there's definitely margin to be had there. Um, that being said, that, you know, this is kind of getting into some of the the concerns about doing this, and um, there's a few there's a few issues that crop up around the monetary compensation. You know, one, as we just learned, it comes with when we start accepting money from people, it comes from a host of it, with a host of requirements that all you know have associated costs and being able to meet. Uh, so, getting people licensed, getting CJ licensed was very difficult. Getting him to pass that written exam, but he did. <laughs> um, you know, getting people licensed, get buying more insurance, um, and then there's the inevitable disruption to the core business. So the farm tours do take place on the weekdays. So the farm crew does kind of have to take time out of their day. Um, there's boats that are being used, uh, you know, and, there, and there's absolutely an opportunity cost to that. You know, while I like to trumpet the fact that the float dinners take place on the weekend, uh, a lot of times it involves me being out there on my like, you know, 21st day of work in a row, uh, schlepping lobsters around and, you know, and cooking for people, which I'm happy to do, but um, sometimes it's, it's kind of a bummer to have to be out there on, on Saturday as well. And I know that is the case for some of the staff that, um, that works for me that I drag out there on Saturday to perform these float dinners. Um, so really what you're getting at is, you know, you reach a point where you have to weigh the cost of, uh, of what you're doing on the operation with the benefit of the business. And, um, you know, where we're at right now, because we're not totally 
we haven't totally figured this tourism thing out um, is, 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 you know, the point where do we invest in infrastructure solely for, uh, you know, to accommodate this tourism business? You know, do we buy another, do we build another oysterplex and buy another boat uh, that, that we can just, you know, take people through all summer long without any disruption to the farm crew? Do I hire a, a summer person to come in and, and be the tour guide and, and run this full time? Or do we dial it back and say, you know, we only do tours on Fridays between the hours of, you know, eight and five o'clock. Uh, you know, there's a sign up on the website. If it's full, too bad, you know, see you next summer. Um, so this, that's kind of the point at, w at which we're at. Um, we've made a lot of money on the float dinners, um, but again, it, it comes at, it comes at, you know, there's a cost involved, um, both monetary and kind of a, a broader cost. Uh, you know, it's harder to quantify of, of time and resources. And then um, opportunity cost. You know, sometimes the argument is always, you know, could I make more money if I worked that seventh day, working on the farm, growing oysters, or making sales calls, or something like that. Um, and these are real considerations, and I, I do wish I had the, all the answers uh, in that regard. But it's really specific to the operations, and uh, and again, it's something that we're still wrapping our heads around uh, and, and are experimenting with different different options. Um, and finally, in terms of the pricing. A big thing uh, from a customer service standpoint that needs to be considered is what you have to do is reckon, you know, what is it going to take, what is it, you know, what number makes it worthwhile for me, the, the guy who runs the business, to be out there on Saturday uh, doing this, or, you know, for the owner operator to be out there, you know, taking people around the, the farm or uh, out to, to haul lobster traps or something like that. And if that's a, you know, if you call it a thousand dollars, you know, if, if, if that's the number, then the, is the experience that you're providing uh, commensurate. So there's an alignment of expectations that needs to occur. So you need to somehow, um, you know, this is a pitfall that we've had in the past, you need to provide enough information about what's going to happen on this tour and what exactly you're going to do. Are you gonna be able, how many lobsters are you going to take home? How much do you get to eat? Uh, you know, all these things so that people come in expecting the right, the right experience. You know, one thing we've had with the float dinners is the word spreads through uh, you know, the Boston restaurant community that Island Creek does these awesome float dinners and, and they're a blast because one, one or two or three or ten groups come down and have a, have a good time doing it. And then all of a sudden people show up in a limo bus, you know, wearing high heels and skirts and everything like that and they get out on the float and it's a windy night and they're getting wet and muddy and they have a terrible time. Um, so we've really started to be explicit about this is, what, this is what we do. This is the essence of the experience. It's a down home lobster bake out on the, out on the bay. You know? and, and again, charging the amount of money that we do, uh, there's a certain implication that comes with that. You know, we're charging you $3,000 to come out here. Some people equate that $3,000 with white tablecloths and caviar and the whole nine yards. Other people equate it, at, you know, as we would hope they do, with the experience and the special access of getting out to Duxbury Bay and eating on, uh, you know, float with the sun setting behind you with your good friends around you with great wine and, and you know, pretty simple food. So um, that's a big part of it. And then delivering on that, you know, once you set the expectation, you, know, you have to deliver that value. Uh, and that's the big part of it that, uh, that a lot of work has gone into. And that is where we've really identified, that's where you start to question, you know, if I really want to be out there delivering the customer service experience that I know needs to be delivered, and we want to go buy the expensive wine, and, and um, I need gar you know gardener to go out and get me the lobsters and everything like that. Uh, and I want two lobsters per person, just in case, instead of one lobster per person. The real cost of pulling it off is actually pretty significant uh, at the end of the day, and that starts to eat into your margin. So, um, you know that that question of value and expectations, I think, is most important, particularly given that um, you know very few of us here. This is not our our, our core. Uh, our core business or our expertise. So um, there's a lot to be learned about um, about how to how to make the experience as good as it possibly can be. Um, you know, I definitely benefited from working on the wind jammers, working on charter boats, uh, being able to provide that hospitality experience, and also even from a safety standpoint of knowing you know in instinctually where people are going to hurt themselves or do something wrong or things like that, and be able to get ahead of it. And that all comes with that's just experience, really. Um, so. Uh, you know, definitely, we uh, the pictures are nice, but we came into this um, and made a bunch of mistakes and figured it out, and we still haven't really all figured it out yet. So, um, as vague as that is, <laughs> uh, I encourage you all to to give it a whirl if uh, if you do find that um, there's opportunity there. It's hard to pass up a good opportunity.
we're really blessed. You know, we have over 27 million people come to Maine every every year for either overnight or day trip, and, and that generates eight billion dollars worth of, of tourism income for the state. Uh, that's nothing to sneeze at. We are the largest industry in the state. It's it's just a uh, a great portion of this, and and and. It, this is nice to be in a room where folks aren't going to be upset because we show off lobsters and lighthouses on all of our brochures. Usually I get a little flack about that in other parts of the state, but this group, I'm sure nobody's upset about having those on every image we have, because that's why one of the main reasons people come to Maine. We keep hearing about Iowa or Illinois. They don't have a coastline, and, and as much as we, I love the Maine woods, there's a lot of wood lakes and rivers between the middle of America and here, but when you get here, not everybody has a coastline. Not everybody has the rich history that we have here, so it's... This is just a nice tag in with, with what's already happening and the reason people come to me. Um, those folks from, uh, from away who are here, if you could cover your ears a second. Um, our mission is to be the premier four season destination in New England. And uh, uh, we're, we're blessed because all of New England will fit inside of Maine. Um, and we are a big, big state. We have a lot to do here. And, and, and uh, from our experience, uh, you know, it, people are always amazed. 92% of the visitors that come to Maine come back. They, you know, it's, it's not like we have to, once you've got somebody here, they love it. How many times have you been someplace and you said, I'm from Maine, and before you get any farther, they go, ah, Maine, I'd love to go to Maine, or I, I went to, I, I'm from Maine, or I went to camp in Maine. It's, it's, it's ever on everybody's bucket list. It is totally on everybody's bucket list, and um, it's, it's just the neatest thing to think that, well, yeah, I live here. I'm a, I'm a native. I'm from Maine. And, but everybody says, ah, Maine, I, I just can't wait to be there sometime in my life. And that's, that's what really what we market. Uh, we have kind of a, a two-pronged approach to, to our marketing for the state of Maine, and that's acquisition to get brand new folks coming here because we know from that 92% that once you get their faces in the state once, they'll come back. More likely, they'll come back. And then the other part is retention. And um, Maine has such a long, rich history in hospitality that, that that's nothing that the Office of Tourism can do other than just remind you that we're still here. Um, that, that they have such great experience when they come to Maine, whether it's their lodging or their, whatever they've done, they can't wait to come back, have a second home here, uh, rent a cottage here every summer, whatever it is. Um, the, the hospitality, the friendliness of, of, of Mainers is, is what brings folks back. Uh, it's it's just, just a special ex experience across the country. Um, it, I worked with Natalie in the past because I was also responsible for the nature-based tourism initiative that we did through Fermata, which was mostly focused in the woods, but really had, is applicable to pretty much everything in the state. That 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 nature-based tourists, as we, which is a horrible name, um, is the experiential tourists. Their folks, the folks that come to Maine for this kind of experience that you have to offer, this is what they want. They want an authentic experience um, that. They can do themselves. I, uh, Chris, I worked. Uh, I, I spent a couple of summers doing photography when I worked for L.L. Bean, and we worked on uh, the Isaac Evans. And uh, those people are willing to pitch in and do the work. You, you know, you know from a windjammer that, that they don't want. They're not on a cruise ship. The folks who want experiences are coming in. They want to raise the sails. They want to drop the anchor. They want to help in the kitchen. Um, they want that exp authentic experience that you can get from what you guys do. And uh, and so you, you've got a good piece to, to target because. Um, it's not, they want to have something they, they can put on their coffee table that's not a thimble or t-shirt. They want to have uh, something authentic for Maine, and they want to be able to tell stories about, hey, I haul lobsters. I don't for 10 minutes, but I hauled them, and you know, <laughs> go that, they, they'll never go that far into it. So um, definitely the right, right focus. Um, our, our target market that, that we shoot for is primarily New England, but also the mid-Atlantic states. Um, as you can tell from the other people in Massachusetts are up here, um, and Rhode Island that uh, you know, we have a large drawer and, and that's, it's easy to get here. Pretty much of a six hour drive time um, is what we look at our main market. And, and uh, so if you're in Aroostook, that's Portland, but for, the, for, for <laughs> yourself, um, <laughs> that goes out of Jersey, it goes out of Jersey. Uh, so a couple of things that, that the office can provide and, and uh, in working with Nature Beast Tourism, one of the things that they identified was, was uh, training, hospitality training that it was really important in Maine. And, and we're all great people and people have great experience, but you know that, that frontline experience for yourselves, for, for whoever you have, have working for you, makes a huge difference in, in, the, in the customer's experience. They've got to know that if someone speaks foreign languages, not to talk louder, it's not necessarily the, the right answer. They've got to know what's going on in the neighborhood uh, so that if people say, well, what else happens down out here you know, in the Bay? Um, what else is happening in town? That you, you can really provide them with a full experience. And, and we were really lucky. We worked with the, uh, the Maine Woods Consortium, with the University of Maine and the uh, Maine uh, Hospitality Alliance to develop um, an online training called Welcome Me. Um, this is, it's free. 
It, uh, it's all online uh, and uh, I, I put, left a bunch of these brochures up front uh, so you can grab one. Um, it, it took me three hours and that's because I was doing it and multitasking and answering phone calls and doing a variety of things. It might take you an hour and a half to go through it. It gives you a series of tests that, or examples and talks about, you know, what, what you should be thinking about, how you look in front of folks, how you pay attention to your customer, how you, you actually listen to your customer, which is really important to be able to do is to listen to see what they're really asking. Um, and just how to respond, and, and uh, there's a variety of customer service pieces to it that take you through scenarios. There's some pre-testing you can do. Um, it's not a gimme, but there's a test at the end that actually provides <coughs> a certificate if you score high enough. Um, and I say it's not a gimme because uh, it's multiple choice and, and don't answer the first, or mark down the first answer that looks like it's, it sounded good to you because they're all good and you got to figure out what the right one is. But it really does make a huge difference in that customer experience. To maintain that 92% of people coming back, it's really important that um, everybody on board, that anybody that has that customer contact has a good sense of who the customer is and, and why you're here. Uh, as I, I mentioned before, I worked for L.L. Bean for 21 years and, and you kind of think you got customer service down, but I missed a couple because I got cocky and I just, oh, that's it, and I didn't even read the third <laughs> all of the above. Um, so um, it, it, it just makes a huge difference on, on who we are and how we're treated. Uh, the way we reach customers for the office that benefits us, and our job is to kind of promote the entire state so we don't focus on, on a small area. So we have print ads, uh, we do our, our visitmain.com, our official state website, uh, we do social media campaign, we have um, what's called pay, unpaid media where we're, we're constantly bringing in um, media writers and, and, and uh, magazine folks or whatever to, to have experience. They, we vet them at the office, but we try to figure folks are going to give a, a really good experience. And, uh, and then that print generally is a lot more than our state's budget. We're, we're about 38th in the, in the country in terms of budgets for, for, average, for promoting tourism in the state. Um, so we really rely on, on what we can get through paid media, unpaid media. Um, we do travel and trade shows. We're just coming up on the season where we're, we're in, we go to the customer. We're in Boston, we're in New York, we're in Philadelphia, we're in DC, we're in Canada, a variety of shows. So we're out there meeting folks, pressing the flesh, and, and making sure that they were remembered in the market. Um, and it, our Canadian market has become better and better um, <coughs> and stronger. I mean, the people have always come here over the years, but, it, but keeping our face out there, now the dollar is almost on par, um, it's really worth it for them coming down here to spend their vacation. I discovered in Toronto two years ago that this is something I never really thought we were. I, we were regarded as the shortcut to Nova Scotia. Um, I never thought Maine was a shortcut to any place, but the, everybody in Toronto said, oh, no, 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 that's a shortcut. We, come right, we don't go across the top of Canada, we come through Maine. So getting them to have, stop and have that coastal experience, because what I always think of is a big lake. Um, we have, you know, real, real lighthouses with tides that come and go and, and great seafood. So it's, it's part of that, capturing that group to come in here. So don't take them for granted. Um, some of the things, I mentioned the website, and that's one of the things that it's, for you, is, is, as you start your business, it's free to be on our website with your business. It's a free listing. I'm, I'm going to ask you. I'm going to tell you where to go, but at the same time, I'm going to tell you, hang on a second, because we're going to launch a brand new website next week, and so I'm sure it'll go better than the Affordable Care Act website. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it's going to be it's going to be really good. It's going to be a couple of weeks before you get all the bugs worked out. So after the first of the year, if you go to motpartners.com, there's a spot where you can register your business. And you can, it'll, it'll actually, which is nice about this new website, it's going to talk you through that registration pieces. They'll have cues and, and bubbles with, with added copy and things you can do. But get your business listed with, with the Main Office Tourism. So when our visitors, and we have um, three and a half million folks come to the visitmain.com website every year. Uh, when they come in and, and, and check in for looking for stuff, they can find you more easily. Uh, there'll be proximity mapping and a variety of stuff, benefits for being able to do that. But that, that is free for anybody in the state. Um, it's free to have an organization list an event. So if you would work with a group of folks and they're doing an event in your community, talk about having their event on the website because it is huge to, to, to be able to help folks search for things when they, they're coming. You know, the majority of folks now do their trip planning <coughs> online. They don't, you know, our visitor centers, have dropped down as much as, as, as with who, how much information they distribute in paper goods because pretty much everybody has stopped. The only reason is, I would say the only reason, but the primary reason they stop at a visitor center now is, is to get some last minute directions that they couldn't figure out how to make their GPS work properly and to use the restroom. Um, so getting yourself online is just huge and, and key. You know, it's nice to have, you should have a website. It's really important because those links are going to take you there and that's how they get people to learn more about you. So I, I would suggest doing that. Uh, 
there's a program called MOT Partners um, where you get to actually work with these media folks that we have. It, it, uh, and that's listed on the website. I don't have the brochure for that because we have a no new brochure. But if you want to host writers or host groups that, that are, have a special interest in doing articles, um, you can work with our PR firm and they'll put you on the list. And so it means you may provide us with, provide the writers with a free pass or whatever. But, but we vet those folks to make sure that we're getting folks that we know we're actually going to get some print out of it. We don't, there's lots of folks out there who say they're writers who are just looking for a vacation. We've, we've figured them out. And uh, so the ones that we check in and send on to our customers, whether it's an inn or meals or an experience, are going to give you a, a, a you, you have a pretty good chance to get some, some press out of the, the whole company. <coughs> Um, the, one of the other jobs I have is I work with the eight main tourism regions. And I don't know if, how many of you know about the eight main tourism regions. Um, but we're broke, the state's broken up into kind of regional areas, um, and each one has a marketing group. And, and we provide money to those kind of regional marketing groups to, to promote their regions. And so they can be much more, talk much more about the uniqueness. Um, so I'm sure none of you really care about the Maine Highlands Moosehead region, but uh, there are, uh, there's the Down East region, which stretches essentially from the Penobscot north or east. Um, there's the Mid Coast region from the bridge to Brunswick. And then there's the, the Portland, Greater Portland Casco Bay region, which is roughly Brunswick uh, to Scarborough, and then the Maine Beaches Association, which is the rest of the coast. So there's lots of places to tag in. They all get about $100,000 a year, which they have to match to, to help promote the, the regional interests themselves. And it would be really good to connect with them. I also have put a bunch of these up front with the, kind of the contact information so you can, can track down um, who the regional rep is. They will also be the folks who can connect you with the chambers, uh, again, who are important to, to your activity. If you've got a business, you really should belong to the chamber and, and get yourself out as, 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 in as many places as you can. Uh, and they'll also be knowing what's going on for regional activities. Yeah, I, I know that uh, Liz Lodgers here, there's the Experience Maine Maritime group that's been that's rejuvenated, uh, promoting Maine's maritime history. Again, it's something huge that not very many places have unless you have a coastline. And um, so they've been tagging events along. It got started with a museum uh, in, in, uh, in Bath, and uh, they exploded. So there's some key events around the state. There's also a place for, for you to connect up and pr promote maritime history. Because again, people want to get out here and, and, and smell that salt air, uh, hear some harsh language if it's Pirates Day. <laughs> and uh, any, day. any day, connect. Well, yeah. <laughs> Remember, if your family read it. Uh, in in our group, I, I also brought up here a sheet of who's who at the Office of Tourism. Uh, we have somebody who works. Uh, Donna Moreland works on Motor Coach. Uh, probably most of you aren't ready for a 60 passenger bus to show up right now. Um, but but in finding out what it takes, because if you don't have a restroom capacity for 60 folks. Uh, aside from the lot of dancing going on on the shoreline, um, you'll have some folks who are kind of upset. So you need to be prepared for that kind of thing. You've got to be visitor ready. That was, but when I'll roll back to that quickly. That was part of the Maine Woods Consortium part. Is we looked at an assessment on what does visitor ready look like. Um, just because uh, you've cleared some stuff off your dock and put a table up in the middle of your barge, uh, you may not be re visitor ready the first time through. But but be be authentic. Be true about what you've got from experience. And I think those are such key words. Is is know what you've got, know what your customer needs, and don't ta tell them a lie. Tell them what you got, because um, if they're if they're expecting to sit on a crate, um, that's fine. But if they think they're going to have one of these chairs and they sit on a crate for an hour, drinking wine, they're going to remember that, or at least there'll be some marks to remind them of that. And so, um, be be true to what you've got. Uh, uh, don't don't fluff it up, but also don't undersell yourself, because you have such unique experiences. I mean, to go out and, and pick an oyster or pull an oyster up and, and chuck it and eat it right there was, uh, I'm assuming you're selling hot sauce. Um, you know, it's, you can't get that in, in Chicago. Um, so connect up with the folks who are doing similar things. Uh, it's great that you mentioned the, the wind jammer industry because there's a bunch of folks who really are talking about this is what authentic looks like. Uh, chat with some of those folks who run wind jammers and say, well, you know, what, what are your customers' expectations? Um, they want that saltwater experience, but they know they got to sleep in a sleeping bag, essentially in the uh, size of a cocoon in, inside the boat. And you know, and nobody complains because they, that's what they were sold on. They, they knew that was coming. Um, so um, quickly, that's what I had to kind of chat about in my 10 minutes. Uh, I know I probably ran over a little bit, but connecting up with those, that tourism piece is really, really important to find out who your partners are that can help you along the way. Uh, the regions are all aware of the welcome me thing if you don't have that. Um, 
the, the regional reps down here actually is Portland CDV that kind of, kind of manages the marketing, but, but all those folks are looking for partners. If you're looking for packaging, um, you know, think about, you don't have to be this, the core of the package. Well, you have something to offer to the B&Bs or to the other folks, that, to the sea kayak guys. You've got a lot to offer. There's people out there looking for things to do to, to expand their experience, and, and that's you. Thank you, Phil.